Or dismiss all these reminders, yes. Continue recording, yes. And share screen, yes. Woody plants. Slideshow from beginning. Are we there? We are there. Good job. Is there. my volume okay, everybody? Are you coming through loud and clear on this end? Okay, cool. I'm fine. All right, y'all know who I am. And Woody Platts is really my thing. I, uh, I taught plant materials down at Mississippi State and uh, get a little resentful around here. Sometimes they send their tree questions to David Merker. Well, he's a forester. That's a whole different thing. That's a crop. I'm talking about woody plants in the landscape, and that's a whole different. And he and he loves me, and I love him. So we send each other the um, the correct material and go. That's that's his question, or you know, that's her question. And y'all know how to find me. So just re, just a re, sweet, quick reminder of how we're going to talk about woody plants. Because remember, it's a material that we're using to build our floor plan, or help accomplish our design goals. We talked a lot about that in the landscape design class that you're gonna design a landscape that suits you and your lifestyle. And these plants are gonna help you. And that's one of the criteria for choosing them. <clears throat> so I hope today to help you think about that as plants, as things that have these roles that you want them to play. Um, pretty is certainly a valuable role, but more than that. And that we're going to uh, talk about the importance of learning that real name. I'm gonna hope, hopefully you're gonna leave this class being friendlier toward the Latin, if you're not now, and why taxonomy is important. Um, where to get those plants and why? Why is it important to buy and uh, from, from different, you know, making decisions about where you're gonna purchase? Where do you get honest information? Because there's a whole lot out there that's not. And what is plant quality? When we talk about, you know, looking for quality plants. We're talking about how important it is to diversify that planting and then, of course, we're going to talk about four seasons of interest because um, too many of us right now, we've got spring fever. We're going to the plant sales. We're going to the garden centers and we're buying all the things that look good right now. And as a result, we have beautiful spring color and not much else the rest of the year. So we're going to start toward the end of this talk with plants for seasonal interest. And we'll start with winter. And I hope you'll end up with a list that you go shop with instead of just the impulse buy. I'm just as guilty as any of you for impulse by those. So I'm just saying, do as I say, not as I do, or at least do some of what I say and not as I do. <clears throat> so we're going to decide why we're going to, you know, buy that plant. It's going to help us, you know, complete our design. It's going to be right for our climate. And we're going to cover that in great detail because a lot of the plants in the big box stores are not necessarily appropriate for us here in West Tennessee. And then even if it's good for our climate, is it going to be the right plant for that particular spot in your landscape? Is it a wet spot? Is it a hot sunny spot? Is it shady? So we got to make sure we're getting um, plants that will work there. And then, then whether it's aesthetics, the pretty part of it, you know, we got to go through all that before we, we don't just grab them because they're pretty. Uh-huh. And best of all worlds is when these plants have, um, you know, multiple roles. If a plant can do a lot of things for me, if it can be my screen and good for wildlife and pretty and adaptable to that site, if it provides edible, you know, landscape for me, gives me different color at different times of the year, you know, to me, those are the ones I'm going to go for. They're going to fill a lot of bills in my criteria. Birds, of course, are important to most of us. We're nurturing people. So I like those plants that do a lot for me. If it's screening, you know, we do a diversity of plants. It's more interesting, seasonal interest, um, different times of the year, different shapes, textures, and colors. Also good wildlife habitat. Or if it's that we want our screen to also be available for Christmas greenery. So multifunctional is always best. Think about plants that can do a lot more. We're also going to talk about um, different ways to achieve a pleasing design, and we'll get into that. Um, you know, a little deeper later on as well, but let's think about form. I know we love color. Color is the first thing. We're very human um, and are drawn to color, which, you know, if you think about the color of ripe fruit, uh, ripe fruit, the, the color of luscious lips, um, color is something that's just appealing to us, but we have to sometimes think about form first and then texture and then color. 
So form, if we see this, how important the form is in this landscape at Fay Bex, that we have plants that are strongly vertical, we have plants that sprawl, uh, plants that have radiating habit. Let's think about those first and then start thinking about the color as well. Look at the interesting shapes in this landscape design. That's all about the, the natural, interesting forms um, from feathery to rounded to very columnar to limbed up. Um, texture, when we talk about plant texture, we're not talking about how it feels to the touch, although we like that too. You know, who doesn't love to stroke a lamb's ear, right? But we're talking about visual texture. And I, I, you know, like Mahoney has this sort of rickrack pattern going on and we see it's, it's cool even in black and white, right? If it has great texture. And sometimes it's fun to create a lot of interest simply by contrasting fine textures with bold textures, as we have here with the bottle brush buckeye, um, a great summer blooming buckeye that's not our red buckeye that's in bloom right now across most of West Tennessee, with this wonderful little Japanese maple. So textural is also part of that consideration. <clears throat> We're going to hit very hard how important it is to have diversified plantings. Um, before my time, the, the American chestnut got wiped out. About the time I guess I was coming along, we were losing the American elms. You know, we had them around our house when I was growing up and then they succumbed to new disease. Um, and there were so many in the country that it you know, killed millions and millions of trees. So if we will learn to diversify plants, then we're going to help you know, keep from just wiping out. We should never invest all our eggs in one basket. We're not going to make it easy for that pest, and we're going to make our landscape difficult to just destroy. It also is going to mean that we can add things if we want to, which is always good right here in the shopping season. I'm not sure if I'm a shopper or a gardener. Um, and we can decide that, you know what, I don't even like that plant. I bought it because of all the hype, but it doesn't really do that much for me, so yank it out. And of course, a big diverse planting is gonna have good predator prey relationships so that you will help with natural pest control that some critter gets to be a problem, some other critter is gonna to wanna to eat it. And then that four seasons of interest. So this is at Jimmy Williams, who I mentioned a lot probably during the landscape design class as well. But look at all the woody plants in there that are gonna provide different seasons of interest and foliage color as well as flower. And then he's understoried them you know, with some shade loving plants that are gonna give a seasonal color. And what we've done here is create a very naturalized habitat um, that is similar to what we would see in a plant community where the leaves themselves are gonna be allowed to fall to the ground, decompose, create a natural mulch, enrich that soil, all the beneficial mycorrhiza and insects that burrow down and help with percolation and air exchange. So. We have imitated mother nature here and therefore created a, a habitat that's gonna be uh, where our, our plants are more likely to succeed than if we just plant them out there and expect them to compete with turf grass and hot sunshine and perhaps uh, fend off lawnmowers and weed eaters and such. What if a disease were to come along and right now nothing bothers your pine holly, you know, Alex vomitory is a good native holly. We can find dwarf forms, upright forms, weeping forms. And it's pretty bulletproof. It doesn't really care if it's in a lot of, uh, you know, if the soils are wet, dry, sun or shade, it's gonna perform for you. But I don't know, some new insect or disease might come down the pipe and decide to attack. And if it does, then that whole planting is gonna be ruined, right? Well, we have ripped this out already. And those of you who've been to the experiment station know this is right at our front door. And now it's full of all sorts of different colorful shrubs and perennials. And then we add annuals as well. Um, for winter and for summer months. So I don't like this style of design. And yet when I was coming up, that's what was taught, plant in mass plantings. And I would say that is also, that could be true on a large campus where one of these and one of those wouldn't work. But in your own landscape, you can certainly plant in onesies and be happy if you put some kind of um, rhythm in there, some kind of structural elements that create a sense of organization. So don't listen to those things that tell you you can't plant in onesies, that you have to plant in masses or in threes and fives. Taint so. <clears throat> so if we ride around and we look at what happens in nature and we think about how that might help certain plants. Uh oh, hold on. I don't know why that am. Help to succeed. Um, 
we realize that out there, there is this, this community of plants. And we talked about the leaves contributing, rotting and decomposing, help sheltering each other from, from wind, shading and keeping the roots cool. Um, we know now that trees can actually communicate chemically. If a pest attacks one, that it can um, somehow chemically signal other plants nearby, other related plants, that they need to up whatever is in their chemical ability to resist that pest. That is science. That's not, you know, singing to your plants to make them feel better. That's actually been proven. Um, we also realize that they exist in certain communities. Like you will not see the same plants down in the low bottoms that flood every spring or whenever we have the hurricane rains that you're going to find on the high and dry sites that drain quickly. So we think about those plant communities and choose the plants that are adapted to those communities, then we're not going to do a whole lot of changes to our soil to make them succeed. And we have these fancy names called, you know, Zurich, which is your high and dry sites where the water is going to be minimal. Mesic is in between. And hydric are those sites, sites that stay wet all the time. And then, of course, uh, we also have to consider um, if they want, you know, to be a in some sun and not some shade, you can find those spots. You see the ones that naturally succeed on the edge of a woodland where they get partial, you know, some sun and some shade. And then even some nights are so particular that it's all about the aspect. And in the wild, I did not know this until David Merker pointed it out, that you're not going to find our northern red oak in the wild except on the northern side of our hills. Um, so I did see that was true because I do have land now where I find uh, the northern red oak. Doesn't mean it won't succeed on the south side of a hill, but in the wild, that's where it's become adapted. It likes that cooler um, site and that cooler soil. And I found on my land, in fact, I have yellow lady slipper orchid and I begin to note, it seemed to be always on the northeast side of the little valleys out in my woodlands and usually associated with our little native um, southern sugar maple, which there is a little southern subspecies of, sh subspecies of sugar maple that we find around um, Jackson um, on the upper upland sides. All right, so I know people are freaking out about Latin names and I may have told you that story before that when I came here, um, somebody asked me about their yellow bells and I was brand new on the job and I was confused. I didn't know what they meant and they said, you don't know what the most common early blooming shrub is in the springtime that has little yellow bells. And I said, do, do you mean for Scythia? And they said, you better learn what we call it here in Tennessee. I said, okay, locally they must call what I call for Scythia yellow bells. Next week, somebody asked me about when they could divide their yellow bells. I said, divide it? Um, it's a really uh, tough old shrub and would be hard to divide but you could root it easily. It roots very easily. You could stick it in the ground during the damp time of the year and it's probably gonna root. And they said, shrub, I thought it was a bulb. So they're talking about their daffodils. So, you know, Latin names are important because different parts of the country, we're gonna call the same plant by different names or we're gonna apply the same name to different plants. And so I don't know what you're talking about. I, don't, I know your mama called it that, but I don't know, you know, what everybody else called it, I need to have that real name. And it can be very important. Now you may think it's not, and it's also oh, nothing is not hard. It is not inherently hard. You already know all these Latin names. Magnolia, Viburnum, Zoysia, Xenia, Salvia, Hibiscus, Rhododendron, Nandina, and Yucca. Are they hard? No, because you're just used to them. And in fact, if you just look at Latin names, um, a lot of times they will clue you in as to what they actually mean. Magnolia grandiflora as the grand, big, large flower. Macrophylla as the big leaf. So if you can speak English, you could um, easily learn the Latin for the plants. Not, they're not all that easy, but a whole lot of them are. So let's still think of it as hard. Let's be friendly about it and think about the importance because it is important. <clears throat> it is the people would say, Use the real name, please. Very annoyed. Well, it is the real name. Um, otherwise, I'm not sure I could communicate with you about where to get one if I don't know its real name because real nurseries and real growers use the Latin name to make sure we're not messing somebody up and sending them the wrong plant. Here's a good example. 
I grew up calling the oak tree on the upper right uh, willow oak, and the one down there on the left was the one I called pin oak. Well, around here, they call the one on the upper right a pin oak, and it's a great oak. I don't know of anything that really bothers it. It's a relatively fast-growing native. It's actually one of the red oak tribe and uh, will tolerate a wide range of conditions. It does quite well. It lives the ones planted at my family home down in North Mississippi are 114 years old, still standing strong. Whereas the one on the left, the one that I call pin oak, um, is, is actually Quercus palustris. The one on the right is Quercus fellows. Well, the one on the left is the oak that is most often removed now in Tennessee landscapes because it's susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch. Allegedly, all oaks are susceptible to bacterial leaf scorch, but our pathologist and I and anybody else I've queried about this have only seen the pin oak, Quercus um, pilustris, which means of the swamp, succumb to bacterial leaf scorch. And there's, they've been taken out in many homes around here on campuses of UT Martin everywhere. But the one on the right is great. So if you ask for a pin oak, you might get that bad oak. But if you ask for the willow oak, which I call, which real name is Quercus fellows, you're going to get the good oak. So be careful. It could be even worse. This beautiful tree that can be called Chinese elm. I try to get people to call it lace bark elm for obvious reasons. Um, Chinese elm can refer to other species of elm that are not as desirable as this elm. Well, there was a guy up in um, Lake County and he had decided he wanted to devote one of his fields that wasn't really good for agriculture into growing some trees that would be used a lot for the Memphis landscapers. So this is the one I recommended. And he, he didn't like the Latin names. He was one of those people that was really offended. Um, he had sent his county agent down here a couple of years later who dropped some twigs on my desk in the middle of winter and said, uh, Greg said that the landscaper said this was the wrong elm. And I glanced at the buds and sure enough, they were, they were not lace bark elm, which has the tiniest little buds in the elm, um, whole elm generous, uh, genera, the genus, but they were Siberian elm, which has real fat black buds. And it sometimes is called Chinese elm and nobody wants it. So I called him and I said, um, you have planted the wrong elm. And he said, can I get my money back from the nursery that sold them to me? And I said, did you ask for them by the Latin name? He said, no, I told you I wasn't gonna use that old Latin. I said, then you don't have a leg to stand on. He had planted 2000, 2000 of them and had two years invested in them. So it is important, it is important. So if you have your walls up about Latin names, let them flow away and learn to see how easy they can be. We are gonna classify a cat. We know it's an animal, chordata, it's got a spine, it's a mammal because it gives milk, it's a carnivore, it's in that cat tribe, it's in the cat family, it's in the genus cat, it's even the species is Felix catus. Felix catus, how easy is that? Now, not all that easy, but that's all we're doing with plants. We as humans just kind of want to put things in a logical order. I mean, it's how we make sense of the world. That's how we kind of structure our thoughts. That's how we came up with math. That's how we came up with music. Right, Chris? Music is structure. So we have to think about the fact that that's a natural thing that occurs, but we humans have imposed this idea of how to classify it so that we can understand the world around us. And that's an admirable thing. I like it when I've learned certain plant families. I said, I may not know you specifically, but I recognize what family you're in. And don't we do that as Southerners? You know, as soon as we meet somebody new and we know uh, what town they're from, we start talking until we meet, you know, come across a name that we share in common that who are they kin to or who do we know? And, you know, then we kind of know their tribe and we're all friendly about it. And we love to do that with plants. We love to do that with birds. We love to do it with them. Then we have cultivars of cat. Did you know we had cultivars of cat? We call them breeds, but they're all cat. They're, you know, Felis catus, but we have the Maine Coon, we have the Siamese, and we had the Persian, you know, among many. So we're doing that with plants as well. We have cultivars that we have selected 
even though they're the same genus and species, because they had special characteristics that we really liked. So we do it with dogs, you know, we do it with apples. I love um, sweet tango and I love um, jazz is another one of my very favorites. I like them with a good sweet tangy mix. So cultivars were deviants from the norm. There was something about them that was a little different than your average. It had a different growth habit or it had you know, longer bloom season or big flowers or flowers that weren't supposed to be that color or, oh my goodness, gold or variegated foliage or lacy. It had uh, little dwarfy ones or weaving ones or ones that look like, you know, just big exclamation points in the landscape. So, or it was the only one that was resistant to a disease that wiped out most of them. It was able to go further north to be planted in colder climates, or it was more heat tolerant and could be planted further south. So uh, sometimes they had great bark or, or colorful stems. So these are all reasons we said, wow, that's different. I want that one. That's got special landscape uses. It's weird because if you think about a factory, if you were watching the line, make sure there weren't any deviants from the norm, you would take those out and throw them in the trash pile. But in the green industry, we take them out and go, man, this is cool. Let's propagate this one and give it a special name and charge more for it. Uh, and those are usually going to have to be vegetatively propagated. If we were to plant, you know, we found this wonderful gold form of this plant and we grew seed from that gold form, it's more than likely you're just going to revert back to the ordinary form with apples. You know, if you plant apple seed off of Granny Smith, you're not going to get a Granny Smith apple. It's going to be some ordinary and possibly bitter and not very tasty apple. To get a Granny Smith, you have to vegetatively propagate it. It's got to be a clone. So we can do that by grafting or by um, rooting those cuttings or by tissue culture. Sometimes we, get, we have seed strains that we can, we can get reliable cultivars. But most of the time we're cloning that exact form. The original Bartlett pear has been being grafted, I think since the 15, since the year 1500 or 1600, somewhere in there. Otherwise it would have just gone away. All right, so let's just do a few more Latin, we'll move on, but let's look at some that are easy so you, you don't feel intimidated. Uh, Chinese pistache, which is a tree that does wonderfully around here because it's related to sumac, and we know how easy that is, grows on our wild roadsides. Its scientific name is pistachia, the pistachio chinensis, the pistache from China. So it actually is a rootstock uh, for the pistachio nuts, one of my favorite nuts. Um, and then there's a cultivar called Pearl Street. Somebody found one on Pearl Street that had reliably brilliant red fog color and maybe was a male because the females of these can recede and you didn't want that. So they gave it the name Pearl Street. Now the other one, we see the going down Alex with an X in the center, a tenuata. Anytime you see that X, it means they hybridized two different species to create a plant that had you know, probably a combination of very good features. So our foster holly, which a lot of us know and grow and love, is a hybrid between two uh, Native American hollies, Ilex opaca, the American holly, and the Cassine holly, which is Ilex Cassine, another easy one. Um, and then on a foster holly once upon a time, there was a little branch that just went weird. We call these, um, we call these sports. There was a sport that suddenly just threw off of a regular old foster holly that was bright gold. And so they take that cutting and they propagate it and see if it will stay gold because sometimes these deviants, these sports can revert back and go back to what is normal after a year or two of being weird. And you know, these deviants can happen from sunlight. Um, you know, mother nature can cause, as we know, sunlight can cause cancer. It can also cause changes in the DNA of plants that can create some weird sports. And it's just, it happens. It's not a man-made thing. A lot of people say, oh, cultivars are weird, you know, Frankenstein plants, they are man-made. No, most of them are actually occur on their own out in the wild, somebody with a sharp eye, or they somebody will deliberately sell out a bunch of seeds and keep a sharp eye on them and see um, something of value and then cultivate it. So without deviation from the norm, as Frank Zappa would say, without deviation from the norm, there could be no progress. 
So we like that. We look for them and we use them. <clears throat> All right, now that we know a little bit about reading through those Latin names, let's do that one on the bottom because boy, is it an easy one. Juniperus horizontalis. So it's a juniper that grows in a horizontal uh, uh, habit and plumosa compacta. Plumes, feathery, and compacta, smaller and more compact. So we know it is a horizontal growing juniper with feathery branching that is smaller than the original plumosa. So not that hard, is it? And um, that's a lot of, you know, makes it easy. Once you kind of get used to them, you realize, I don't, I don't even know why I ever thought this was hard. God, if a girl that grew up on a dairy farm in Mississippi can master the Latin name of plants, y'all can't be that hard. Now, why are cultivars important? Because Okay, with some it's not. I could plan out a thousand willow oak acorns and they're probably all gonna be pretty darn good and very similar for landscape shade trees. But with some plants, there's so much genetic variety. You know, remember what makes seed is that a parent and another parent contribute cro chromosomes and they mix up. So I'm one of seven kids. Uh, some of us are blue eyed, some of us are green eyed. Some of us could, you know, uh, not be trusted with a grocery list, whereas some of us were scholarship material, and I won't name names, but you want scholarship material. So if you said Carol Reese, my magnolia, which is a native, by the way, which you start getting about halfway between here and the Gulf Coast, my magnolia has made some seedlings in the edge of my woods and I've dug them up. Would, would you like one for your property? I know you've got a large property and um, you would love the magnolia somewhere. And I would say, no, thank you. And they say, it's free though. And I said, no, no, it's not free. Um, I've got to plant it. I've got to water it. I got to mow around it. Um, it's going to take about, you know, 15 years to see if it's when it's going to, if it's going to bloom. It, it may not be a good bloomer. It may have an ugly spare habit like the one on the left. We've all seen magnolias that just they're not dense, full, nicely shaped plants. And I don't mind that. I think that's a pretty interesting sculptural looking plant. But if you were looking for that nice, dense type pyramid, then you would want to get one that had a name ascribed to it that is one that is known to be a nice, tight pyramid with those beautiful golden brown backs like Little Jim or Teddy Bear. And these are ones that are also more compact. So if you want a dwarf, a dwarf er, because they still get pretty big, Southern Magnolia, um, you would want one of those rather than the ones that are gonna be so big, they're gonna eat your yard and the neighbors and part of the neighbor's yard as well. So that's an important genera for you to pay a little bit more money to get the ones that have the cultivar names. Now, if you are the person who has found that specific little gem Magnolia, also uh, prized because it will continue to bloom throughout summer and fall, um, then you actually own that patent. You can patent it and own that patent for 20 years. And you can tell, um, you can allow only certain people to grow it. You call them your licensed propagators. They have to be licensed from you to produce that plant because you want to control how good that plant looks when it gets to the garden centers. You want to preserve its, its name, its, its integrity, its honor. It's got to go out as a good looking plant. And so you only choose certain people that are allowed, like the new Bowers in Middle Tennessee, Denny Werner, who's created so many of these new and wonderful red buds. That's one of, um, he's, he usually licensed them because the new, new Bowers will only send out fantastic, perfect specimens of his red buds with all the different colored leaves and different colors of blooms and the weeping habits. So um, you, after 20 years, that, that patent does expire and other people can begin to propagate it. So you get to pay a little bit more because those licensed propagators have to pay the owner of that patent a little bit more in order to get that patent and that license. And it gets passed on to the consumer. But you know then you're getting a good plant. You're getting that plant in shape and what its habit's supposed to be. So you're not risking 15 or 20 years on a sorry magnolia that you may pay somebody to take out because it's just a not at all what you had hoped for. Crepe myrtles are another one. Like if you're in a garden center and they've got crepe myrtles labeled pink, red, white, leave. You are not in a good garden center. You should give them a good lecture before you leave. Say, 
you should know that cultivar names need to be on these crepe myrtles so that I know exactly what shade of pink, whether it's going to be a tree form or a dwarf, because there are crepe myrtles that are little weeping dwarfs. There are crepe myrtles that only get as big as boxwoods, you know, whether they have great bark, whether they have great fall color, whether they're resistant to the um, sooty mold, how cold hardy they are, how long is the bloom season? I want to know, I want a Natchez, you know, if I want a big tree form crepe myrtle, it's going to be big enough to shade my parking area or even my house, but I may want just a little blooming crepe myrtle out there, you know, by the corner of my driveway where I turn so it doesn't obstruct my view. Cultivar names are extremely important. <clears throat> just a little bit on, we're not going to waste much time on uh, leaf ID and all that kind of stuff, but just want to mention it real quick because I get a lot, a lot, a lot of, you know, requests to ID plants. So leaf IDs are great but there's so much more to it than just a leaf. I wish um, these parents wouldn't go around and collect leaves for their students because the students really need to see the whole plant. They need to see the shape, you know, the, the, the leaf arrangement. There's so much more to it. Sometimes just a leaf is enough to ID. You know, our state tree, the tulip poplar, that's a very distinctive leaf. But this leaf shape is so common it's really just not enough for ID unless you've just looked at a whole lot of what we call elliptic, elliptic leaves um, and studied the margins and know which would be smooth or serrated and what the point should look like. But most of the time we're gonna need more than just that leaf. So like all these are you know, trees that are native to Tennessee and I'll have this very typical leaf shape. So we got black gum, fringe tree, persimmon, sweet bay magnolia and dogwood. You know, I might know those by the venation patterns because I've looked at them so much, but most people that leaf is not going to be enough. We need to know so much more. First of all, they might not even have the whole leaf. They may just be bringing us a leaflet. Hopefully you remember from your botany class, every leaf has to have a bud. So if they just bring me a little piece of a leaf, it's going to be especially difficult. Um, and there are lots of different kinds. Now, you know, in the old days, before we could all send each other an instant picture, people would call me up and try to describe something on the phone. And famously, this actually happened. I'm doing a radio show, and they called and said, can you tell us what this plant is that in Mama's yard, this bush blooms every spring? And I said, I'll try. Well, it's got green pointed leaves and white flowers. I said, could you give me a little more than that? And this, are the leaves uh, big or small? Well, pretty big. So we, now if somebody were to call and they knew all the lingo, like if I had time to spend two weeks with you and you called me, you said, Harold, there's a little tree that's coming from my flower bed. I'm trying to decide if I want to dig it up and plant it somewhere else or just throw it away. It's got an accumulated point, which means a very sharp, elongated tip. The leaf base is oblique, which means they don't quite meet at the same place on the bottom of the stem there. A doubly serrated margin. And the top of that leaf surface is scabrous, which means it's just like a cat's tongue. It's so rough when you rub it on your face. I'd say it's an elm. I may not be able to tell you which elm, but it's an elm. But we don't have time, y'all. We don't have time to learn all the leaf margins and shapes and tips. But just so you know, they're out there, right? The leaf arrangements, are they stair stepping up and down the stem, we call that an alternate, are they opposite, are they whirled? All these are great. You know, even the leaf scar characteristics, these are all fun things to learn. Um, how many, you know, veins where they're coming from the stem, how many scales are on there on the but it can go off into detail and more and more detail. We just don't have time. Um, find a dendrology class, that's where I picked all that up and frankly, I loved every bit of it. So you're gonna send me a picture, that's what we do. Please tell me where you are. I can't tell you how many hours I spent trying to identify a plant for some friends of mine that were in Hawaii and didn't mention that. Or send me a plant picture that confuses me because I'm usually thinking currently, like right now if I'm walking around and somebody said, you know, there's something red blooming out in the woods this time of year. It looks kind of like a salvia tree. I'd say it's a red buckeye. But if they saw it later, there's a shrub blooming red out in the woods and it's July, then I would know it was probably azalea prunifolia, one of our native azaleas, if they were in, far, in uh, Georgia where you normally find it. Um, so I, I need to know where you are. I need to know what time of year it is. Please supply all that kinds of information. 
Even better, you know, if, I mean, it's going to be a whole different thing if you're at a botanical garden, right? Or in a landscape. But if you're out in the wild, um, then my mind's going to go to a whole different set of plants. And there, I want you to get me a picture of the whole growth habit and the, how are the leaves arranged on the stem. If you can get some bark and the fruit and the flowers are best ways to ID plants. The way the twigs look or act and act, but I mean, they sometimes have different growth habits. They can leapfrog each other. Um, the way the buds look and, and of course, wood grain and color. Those of us who shop for furniture know that that's another way to it. If it is a wild setting, are you in the swamp? Are you up on the hills in between? And even what county are you in? Because I might have an idea looking at it of what genus it is, but you know, I can go to the UT Herbarium website and I can Google in the genus of a particular plant. What did I just, just did that with something today? Oh goodness, what was it? Oh yeah, Zizia, which is our one of our few native hosts for the black swallowtail butterfly. You know, most of us plant the non-native parsley and fennel for the black swallowtails because we have so few native hosts. It's good sometimes to plant non-natives for caterpillars. Um, and I was looking at how much Zizia there was in the state of Tennessee. And most of it's over in Middle Tennessee, Middle Tennessee on the Cumberland Plateau and a little bit over in East Tennessee, but almost none over here. So it will tell me, I clicked on Zizia, Aria, which is the one I was looking for and clicked maps. And guess what? The counties over here, you know, there's just not any Zizia aria to speak of. A couple of places has been reported. So that's very helpful too. And then what sort of plant community? What were the other plants growing around it? Because that's going to tell me a lot about what the soils are like right there. So if it's a dogwood and you're in a plant community that's like, you know, red maple and button bush and all the things I associate with wetland, there's probably going to be this dogwood, the gray dogwood, the Cornus racemosa. If you're in an upland xeric setting where it's well drained and good uh, forest uh, soil, then it's probably going to be our Cornus Florida, the flowering dogwood that's just spectacular right about now across the state. It may be uh, maybe really peaking over in Memphis. It's not for us just yet. So there's the silhouettes all you need for ID, right? We drive around and we see something like that. That's the, the pyramidal form we associate with common bald cypress or down redwood, which is, uh, well, I say it's non-native. It was native to North America and now we've reintroduced it. Um, got wiped out by the ice ages. And it's so funny to see that cypress trees will do this through their youth, by the way, notice this. And next time you drive across a bridge where you see big old mature cypress trees, you'll see they hit a certain point where they decide to flatten out at the top. It's kind of like clouds, those thunderheads. Then when they hit a certain place in the stratosphere, they begin to go sideways instead of up. And old cypress trees will do that. Uh, kind of fun to see how that happens. Here's, a, here's one we know by the growth habit. You know, our Eastern red cedar in its youth will have this wonderful pyramidal habit. And it also tends to flatten out and get more rangy as it gets older. The American elms, it's easy to recognize once you recognize that big vase shape. So it didn't all get wiped out. And if you train yourself to look at plant shapes as you drive, you can identify American elms still out there in the woodlands by this beautiful fountain shape, um, especially in the winter, it seems like they really show up to me. And that shape was why it was considered America's number one shade tree, why it would arch and canopy over the street and over the house, the two-story old Victorian that I grew up in uh, was surrounded by the American elms with willow oaks on each corner and pecans on the other corners. But it was the elms that canopied over and, and that house that had no air conditioning, you know, during my ch childhood years, we would have died without those, that canopy of shade over the house. And unfortunately, we overplanted them. Bark can be, in bark, can be very distinctive on some trees. This is persimmon. All others can be a little trickier, the different oaks, but there's a few that should jump out to you with just a little bit of practice. Fruits and flowers are the number one way because plants are related by their um, reproductive parts. We forget sometimes that flowers are sex organs. And just like with animals that can't crossbreed because their sex organs don't quite match, um, plants can only interbreed if their sex organs are similar enough to match. So we see it how very different the fruits and flowers are, then that tells us, you know, that these plants are related. 
So our garden bean, you know, we call that a lagoon. Well, right out here, the red buds have just finished their blooming and now they are forming little beans, which that tells us then they are legumes. They are in the same family. Now they're not closely enough related, obviously, to cross a garden bean with a red family. So it's interesting to kind of see these relationships. We know these Samaras are always going to be associated with maples. We may not be able to say which maple, but we know it's a maple and it's a great starting place. Five petal flowers that are blooming right now um, are in rosaceae. So a wild rose, as you probably have seen, usually just has the five petals. So peach, pear, apple, strawberry, all these are in rosaceae and may be subject to some of the same diseases. So that helps us think about what the disease might be if we see a problem that's on the, on the rosaceae family. For example, fire blight's a common problem with pear and with apple, but did you know it can also affect pyracantha, it can also affect cotoneaster, which are in the same family as rosaceae. Let's give, we'll give one last example. Hibiscus flowers are really easy to recognize, right? Because they stick all their sex parts out right there at you going, oh, over here, pollinate me. So then we have perennial hibiscus. We recognize then, okay, this is a native to our ditches and swamps. Now we bred them for different colors. Obviously, that's a hibiscus, hibiscus muscutose and the mini hybrids. Here's our old Rose of Sharon. I grew up calling shrub althea. Althea is just called in other parts of the country. And yeah, look, it's a hibiscus. It's hibiscus syriacus because it originated in Syria. <clears throat> And then we look and we're out in our garden and it's late and hot summer and we see the flowers on the right hand side is an okra. Well, I'll be darned, it's also a hibiscus. And on the left, what do we see driving around West Tennessee? The flower that says, hey, I'm in the same family, I'm a hibiscus too. And the little capsule fruit down there on the bottom left that looks so similar to that okra, that is a cotton bowl. So what do all those plants have in common? They do great in the heat and humidity of the deep south. They do great here. So it tells us something, that plant family has these characteristics. And I think that's kind of fun to know. And I hope you, you know, find time to study some of that and, and um, learn to recognize your friends and, and enemies. All right, let's go into hardiness. What will grow here? Now, we see there the state of Tennessee has uh, most of us now in zone seven, that kind of pinkish color with just a bit of it in zone six, up in the higher, more northern regions and the mountainous regions uh, where it is certainly quite cold, well, a good bit more colder. And they just go up and down by 10 degree increments. So if you go all the way down, I'm in, you know, my family is in North Mississippi. We grew up outside of Starkville. You see there, we got some zone seven, and then we start getting into some zone eight as we go on down. Um, also notice how they kind of move our zone sevens, our sixes especially, they wrap around the continent. Now we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but let's look at what that means in actual temperatures. So seven's easy to remember. It means our average annual extreme minimum. Oh gosh, as an ex English major, I despise that group of adjectives together. It's just confusing. Um, zone seven starts at zero. So we are gonna buy plants that should be expected to survive the occasional winter that's gonna reach zero. Although we know sometimes in the past it's gotten colder and a lot of times, especially lately, it hadn't gotten that cold. If we go down a zone, it means that we could buy plants that could only be expected to survive a 10 degree winter. And we go up a zone, then it's a negative 10. So we're pretty, pretty lucky, I think, that we remember we start at zero, zero to 10. Um, it's also important to remember that, you know, we like to make all these black and white things and we like numbers and we try to cram Mother Nature <clears throat> into fitting in these little columns, but she's not going to help us out a whole lot. So um, anybody remembers the Easter freeze of 2007? Um, it was the warmest March on record, followed by a cold snap in April when it got down into the teens. And that was three nights of teens and low 20s where I lived in Chester County. And it killed things that are bone hardy to zone five. 
because everything was juiced up. They thought it was spring. And Mother Nature said, watch this. Y'all think y'all got me figured out. Same thing can happen if we have a warm, wet fall and then a sudden hard freeze, which happened the year before last, and killed back my crepe myrtles before they had time to get ready for cold weather. They were still green. They were in full leaf. They were all juiced up and bam, hard freeze. And it killed them all the way back. And I started all over all the way from the ground. So she's not going to um, fit neatly into these categories, but it's the best we can do. Y'all as humans is a general guide of how to decide what can survive our winters. Now, um, look at how it's changed. This is over years and years of data, of satellite data too. We can't rely on temperatures taking on the ground because often we have what we call urban heat islands. So some of our oldest records, um, cities have grown up around them. And so the warmth there is actually not an accurate uh, portrayal of whether or not we've actually warmed up. Satellite data is because it takes them randomly all around the, the, the globe. And from that, they finally concluded that we need a new hardiness zone map that see how Tennessee had been a lot of six and only a little bit of seven. And then we got changed to mostly seven and only a little bit of six. So that's where we are. This isolate zone seven, since that's where we are today and we're talking about that. In, in Memphis, actually, there's a little tiny little dollop of zone eight right down in the corner. You know, right there, you in the inner city, y'all can get away with growing fascia and St. Augustine and things that I, I can't here just an hour away, <clears> an <throat> hour, depending on how fast you drive, hour and a half. Um, notice how seven wraps up all the way up into the New England states. And oh my gosh, look up there, it's bumping on into Canada. And if this map showed Canada, you would see that we've got zone seven and even zone eight up in Canada. And that's because of the oceanic influences that are gonna um, temper those temper temperature changes. So yeah, you can grow some of the very same plants up in New England that we can grow right here in Tennessee uh, because of the, the water, the ocean. And of course, the altitudes also will affect some things as well. If you've been to uh, Vancouver, you know, you know they're cooler in the summer than we are and they're warmer in the winter than we are and they can grow all kinds of exotic things we can and it's just not fair, nor do they have the insect and disease pressure that we do and it's just not fair. What kills a lot of our plants here in West Tennessee is heat. Um, I've had my own family members argue with me. They bought 20 of a plant that I said, why didn't you call me first? Before you spent that money, it is not gonna live here. Says on the tag, it's hardy to zone five. I said, yeah, Marianne, it's not the winter that's gonna kill it here, it's our summers. Now, her daughter, my niece, said that she tried so hard to make those plants live to prove me wrong. And guess what? All 20 are dead. And I'm petty enough to be happy about being right because she should have called me. She doesn't uh, appreciate the fact that I might know a little bit more than she does about gardening. Um, though I've done this now for decades, you'd think she would appreciate it. Anyway, Plant heat zone map was a good idea, but it didn't work because the American Horticulture Society based it purely on temperatures, daytime temperatures. Nighttime temperatures are the real story. Remember photosynthesis, the nighttime it's gotta respire, the photosynthesis in the day, nighttime it respires. You know, so these, it's taking in oxygen, it's, re, it's releasing oxygen part of the day and it's taking in carbon dioxide, other parts of the day, and the hot nights interfere with that. So it is hot nights that are actually most crucial. Out in the desert, it gets just as hot or hotter than we do right here, but the temperature plummets. They have really cool nights because the humidity that we have holds in our heat, especially you over in Memphis. I don't know how, how y'all endure 80 degree nights. That's just nuts. I look at y'all on the weather often during the summer and feel, feel sorry for you. Um, anyway, so hot nights and humidity, because humidity, if you remember the disease triangle, you got to have the right pathogen, you got to have the right host plant, and you got to have the right conditions for that disease to thrive. And humidity is what fungus loves. So 
plants I would go with my parents. We have an orchard down in North Mississippi and we would go out west or up north and they would be able to grow this apple tree or that plum tree without you know, any spraying. It did not succumb to these fungal diseases. We want that. Uh, not only do, would we like to just say we we're 100% organic, but we're lazy. We didn't want to have to spray. We'll bring it back and plant it in North Mississippi and, and they would die because the heat, the humidity, the diseases would just take them down. All right, so heat. And that's the problem with a lot of the plants at the big box stores. You have to be very careful why they, you know, buy regionally and they don't have to pay for plants that die. When you take that plant back to the big box store and say, you know, replace this plant because it died, that cost goes back to the grower, not to the big box store. Whereas our local mom and pop nurseries, the ones that are owned by, you know, people that grew up right here, they have to buy those plants. And those plants that die that they have to replace um, cost them money. And so they're going to try to buy the plants that they know are going to survive well here in this region, appropriate for this climate. Doesn't mean customers don't take plants home and kill them because they do. I worked at a garden center called Zone 7 down in Starkville while I was in school at Mississippi State, and people would come buy plants, take them home, and three weeks later, come back in with dead plants, wanting, wanting them replaced. And it was because they didn't water them, or they planted them in the wrong place. I, there were so many times people killed plants, and I had to replace them because we had to compete with that plant store guarantee. And I resented it. It's just not right. I have a whole handout, you know, came along with the things that I sent you called, why did my plant die? And hopefully it will tell you how not to kill your plants. All right. So Colorado blue spruce, it's called Colorado for a reason. It likes to be in the mountains. Yeah, every now and then you see one surviving, but most of them don't try, don't try it. Maybe if you get over in East Tennessee, you'll have better luck, but not here. Um, you can cheat a little bit with some zone eight plants. If you find that spot in your yard that's a little bit warmer, this is Choicea ternata. It's called Sundance, it's a gold form. It's a member of the citrus family. If you've got a courtyard um, that's a little warmer, protected, you, you know, swimming pools hold and retain heat. Uh, southern walls can. If it's near, you know, where your fireplace or your wherever you, there's some warmth generated from your house, that might be a place to cheat and get away with growing a plant we love. We call it zone denial, trying new ones. Also, certain times, certain cultivars will allow you to grow plants that shouldn't grow here. So when some friends of mine in the Magnolia Society uh, called me, they wanted to collect seed from the most northern population of Sweet Bay Magnolia. Well, as far as I knew, I didn't know that there were some that actually grew here in Tennessee, right down here at Chickasaw State Park, one, uh, one county south of where I'm sitting right now. But taxonomic records indicated there were. I knew a park ranger that worked there. He knew where they were. So they came and collected the seed from the northernmost population, which gave them a better chance of, of getting a sweet bay that they could grow in Ohio as compared to if they had gone and gotten seed from Mobile, Alabama, where sweet bays are just rampant in the woodlands there. So look for those cultivars that are known to be more cold hardy. For us, we can all grow sweet bay here in, in Tennessee, but in certain plants, they're borderline, look for those. Another rule of thumb with plants um, about helping them find where they will survive is that you can take plants out of the swamp and plant them on a drier site and they seem to be thrilled. You can grow, you know, bald cypress you will only find in the swamps, but it's all over Mississippi State campus. It was my mother's favorite shade tree. She planted them all around the houses on our farm. She would ramble them in naturalistic looking grows down toward the edge of the pond. And then some were right in the water and the ones in the water grew slower than the ones that were up on higher and drier soil. Same is true of winterberry holly in the wild. I've only found it in the water, but it's happier in the drier sites. Same with Virginia sweet spire, only see it in the water in the wild, but it's thrilled to be out of the water. You can take plants out of low wet sites and get them to succeed on drier sites, but you cannot do the reverse. If it's a plant that has to have air exchange around those roots and dogwood is a great example. 
then you cannot put it on a wet site, it will die. So remember that. Low plants can go up, but up plants cannot go low. What else might make you decide on a particular tree? <clears throat> um, you know, no tree is perfect. My mother liked to claim that common bald cypress was, but yeah, they do drop some leaves, even though she said the little leaves blew away and in the fall wind she didn't have to rake them because sometimes the cones that will drop out of it can be sticky and have a sticky rosin that if you were to track through them and then into your carpet, although I don't have carpet because all my dogs, you would see that it could be a problem. Um, but there are some trees that have lots of problems and are either not good landscape trees at all or require very special siting or even selecting for particular forms. We'll detail that here in a minute. Also, some are just disease prone. Like, I mean, an ornamental cherry is a thing of beauty, but many are going to succumb to peach tree borer. Peach tree borer attacks everything in the prunus family. Peach trees, plum trees, cherry trees, uh, even the laurel, you know, prunus um, laurel cerasis that we use so much, auto skip laurels, all those that we use in our landscape are attacked by peach tree borer, and they're getting worse. Um, so I do tell people, don't, don't say y'all never have one because it may get attracted by peach tree borer. Do what Michael Durr says. He said, they're so beautiful in the landscape, go ahead and plant one, but be aware that it could be a short time to enjoy. He said, the chocolate cake doesn't last long at my house either, but it doesn't mean I never buy one. So don't make it your major landscape statement, okay? Kind of consider it that you're going to put it in a disposable part of the landscape so that you can um, survive its death without devastating your design. Is it weedy, whether it comes up like crazy from suckering or it reseeds everywhere? Has it got litters, just drop stuff all the time that you're having to contend with? Uh, are the roots a problem? Nothing will grow under it. Like don't limb up your Southern magnolias because nothing wants to grow under there and the roots are just, you know, in the, the big leaf litter. So, there are ways you could avoid that by simply not limbing them up, but otherwise don't plant one. And then some are weak wooded and we've seen that with, you know, the horrible and now invasive Bradford pear that are gonna snap easily. And, and so will pines, they take up snow and ice. Some have thorns, people get all upset about having a thorny plant out there yet they'll plant a knockout rose. And some have poisonous fruits um, though most of the time, I think the fear of poisonous fruits is exaggerated or overrated. So as there's a mess factor you might not see until you live under it. Now, some trees actually discourage other plants from succeeding nearby. American sycamore has great big old brown leaves. It's subject to some leaf diseases. It can defoliate early. Looks like brown paper bags have fallen on the lawn, but I love the white bark. And so I decided I wanted one over my patio, but I didn't also know it was prone to a whole lot of insects and that there were little caterpillars that stung if they touched your skin in there and that they also dropped caterpillar poo on the table and the chairs. On the, So I loved my sycamore that I planted over my patio for a few years just to look at it, but I was miserable. The, the patio was hardly usable for that darn tree. And I was so glad when lightning struck it and killed. I was 4th of July one year when I still lived down on the farm and was in school. I was so thrilled when that tree was gone. I learned then, don't let a tree hold me hostage. And pay attention to Mike Durr, who I'll explain who he is in a minute, when he says, some trees are beautiful in river bottoms and should remain there. And that's so true. Other trees have big messy fruit. I mean, glad we have these on the farm. It wouldn't been near as much fun. The horses loved them, cows ate them. We threw them at each other. We shot them with guns. We tried to hit the train with them. So, but you don't want one of those in your yard. Walnuts, we know they're difficult to grow under. Plus those, those hard seeds can be dangerous thrown with a lawnmower. And uh, they put out a toxicity around the roots that discourages other plants. Crab apples are fantastic, right? They're great for wildlife. They flower for our pollinators. The fruit can be delicious for both us and the wildlife. There are caterpillars that actually can feed on those leaves that some might think of as pests, and those who love birds might see as beneficial for the birds, which kills me, you know, when you talk about certain people saying native, only native plants will support our caterpillars. 
I'm like, that's not true, or there wouldn't be careers in entomology trying to protect a lot of these plants that we put out there, uh, both for fruit crops and for ornamentals. So plant your crab apples, don't feel guilty about it. You are serving a whole lot of wildlife uh, by planting a crab apple. But do you want that right over your patio or over your the bed of your pickup truck? I don't think so, because that fruit's gonna fall and it's gonna smash and gonna get rotted. What loves them besides birds and other wildlife? Yellow jackets, they like to get on that rotten smashed fruit. But out in the corner of the yard where it's gonna attract wildlife, you'd be thrilled to have that crab apple, enjoy that bloom. So as soon as it's about placement and those bad habits will not be troublesome. The hackberry trees that can get a um, sooty mold created by a pest, that's a uh, hackberry aphid, that sucks sap from the leaves and poops sap on everything below. And then this little black mold grows in all that poop. So if you've got a patio under a car under it, then you're gonna be covered with sticky black film. But it's a great plant for birds. Birds love the fruit. There's a hackberry butterfly that loves this particular tree. So on the perimeter of your yard, it's, it's gonna be enjoyable. Just don't put it in the wrong spot. For simmons, you can avoid the issue of messy fruit by choosing the right gender. The females are the only ones, it's a dioecious tree. You gotta have a boy tree and you gotta have a girl tree to make these babies, that's what the fruit is. So if you have um, a female tree, I'm lucky in that I do have a naturally occurred there on my property and it's out back, um, kind of back, back near the propane type. You gotta have a male over closer to the deck and patio. So the male doesn't make the messy fruit, but it's close enough to pollinate the female. So I can enjoy all the wildlife that comes because lots and lots and lots of wild creatures love ripe persimmons, as do I. So uh, sometimes it's about gender. Gender selection, I've always wanted to call it, have a nursery that I call gender issues because sometimes you want the female, sometimes you want the male, sometimes you want both because you want to make babies. Um, ginkgo is another one where we do not want that female, right? It's a smelly, beautiful little fruit. It looks like something we could eat. You can roast and eat that nut, but the pulp is what smells so bad. The pulp around surrounding that uh, nut that you might roast stinks with something like baby vomit, feta cheese, a really nasty, truly nasty, rotten smell. Luckily, we had a female on campus, so I could teach that one to my students because people never forget a bad smell. Right now, well, or even a good smell, you can remember what your grandmother's dresser smelled like or her cheek when you kissed her, right? Um, and stinky things also create memory. So, or right next to that part of your brain. So I had one on campus and it was amazing to me how the students were willing to smell stinky things. They'd pass it around and go, yeah, smell it. Everybody would they go, oh man, it stinks. And everybody would smell it. So then they knew by the male, not the female. How do you know it's a male? No, you can't lift the bark and peek at the crotch. You have to buy a grafted plant because the seedlings, you can plant out a row of ginkgo seedlings. We don't know if they're male or female. We won't know for 20 years or so, but that doesn't matter because we're taking a stick off a known male over here. We're cutting off that seedling, sticking that grafted, that, that root, that cyan, of the known male onto that rootstock. And so the rootstock could be a female, doesn't matter because everything from the graft on up is gonna be a male. Since we want the female with hollies, we prize those red berries, especially with our uh, deciduous hollies, the winterberry holly and the possum haul. Um, and a lot of people don't realize sometimes that they're not making good berries for you in your landscape because you may not have a male pollinator close enough to do you need to buy a male pollinator, which always have wonderful masculine appealing names like Apollo's Glory or Southern Gentleman. Suckering, especially with purple leaf plums, one of the ones I see over and over and over in landscapes where they just come up like mad from the roots. So the original purple leaf plum might succumb to peach tree borer, but don't worry, you'll have thousands left to choose from. And your neighbor may have some over in his perfect turf grass and may not be very happy about that. So it's one of those plants that's actually on my recommended, maybe don't plant this list. 
because of the issues that it can cause. And we already mentioned disease prone, the bacterial leaf scorch on the Quercus palustris or the um, pin oak, remember the difference in those. Radford's invasive snap, they grow themselves to death. They just are, um, gosh, you know, we haven't been recommending this for years and yet somehow university people still get blamed for pushing the Bradford pear. Maybe university people did before my time, but in my era, no one has ever said, please plant Bradford's because by the time I came along, we knew that was the tree most likely to fall on your car in the parking lot yet it was probably the tree most often planted in parking lots all across the South. Pine trees I love, don't say, you know, that pine trees are bad, I'm not telling you that because they sigh, they smell good, they provide for certain birds that other trees do not, and you get free pine needles if you've got a grove of them close enough to you, but I sure don't want one near the house. Those suckers are gonna go down. Those little needles, they just collect ice, they collect snow, they snap easy. They're prone to a lot of different diseases. So this is what you're gonna, if you're gonna have pine trees, you know, they just seem to suck um, weight, uh, weighty snows out of the air and go down on you. So if you got them somewhere on your property, great. Don't use them close to those thing, places that you might suffer. That's a lot to know. We, we want a book to tell us what to plant then, dang it. We gotta make, consider all these things. And I have Skadoodles of books behind me, and I have shelves of books at home. I have boxes over here that I still haven't unboxed since they did the remodeling. But you know how hard they touch them? I just use one book a lot. And if you said, Carol Reese, you could only have one book, it'd be the one. There's no even second thought about it. I'm going to grab this one. This is Michael Durr's Manual of Woody Landscape Plants. He's written other books and I'll mention those, but this one, it's a huge thick encyclopedic volume and you think it's gonna be very dry. Their identification, ornamental characteristics, culture propagation and uses. But this is a guy who's passionate and he writes about plants um, in a very honest and opinionated way. How many plant books do you have that warn you not to plant certain trees or say things that are so memorable like a tree that should stay in river bottoms or wisteria is a vine best enjoyed in other people's yards. And yet we'll wax poetic about, you know, the first time he saw Amazing Grace, the weeping Katsura when he's standing in Spring Grove Cemetery and what music was playing and what he was wearing. I mean, practically, you know, it reads like a novel. I read it from Abelia to Zizophus. And I bought a lot of plants because of what Mike Durr said. And it turns out he's one of the only people that will tell you when a plant is just really a dog. And he's, he will set, tell you that he's killed these plants over and over that he loved and wanted to grow so badly. The good news is he's a southerner now. He was a northerner and he took a job in Athens, Georgia. And it turned out a lot of the plants he could succeed with that he, when he was in Illinois and Ohio, could not succeed in the heat of the South. So in there, he's very specific. And most other you know, books do not tell you that. How far South can you grow this, these? Which ones are especially sensitive to heat and humidity problems? Uh, which cultivar might provide you the best opportunity? In plant circles, in woody plant circles, we call this the dur. There are other Durr books. This one is the Durr. And it is the plant that is the book that is most used in college courses across the country. Um, and it's going to cost you a nice sum, you know, somewhere between 80 to to $100 even on Amazon used, but well worth it because of how much information it's going to give you and how honest it is. I agree with him, I'd say, you know, 98.6% of the time. Sometimes I disagree, but that's my right to do so. He's a great guy, by the way, very generous and has, um, I've gotten to stay at his house. He's had our master gardeners over, et cetera, et cetera given us a lot of cool plants over the years as well. Mike Durr, um, he's, just, he's just gonna call it like it is, he's honest. These are some of his other books. And if you're into hydrangeas, in that hydrangea book, which you know he's a breeder now, he's retired and he's breeding hydrangeas that have to have special characteristics. They have to be re-bloomers, they have to have 
spectacular flowers. They have to have good, healthy, beautiful, disease-resistant foliage and be cold hardy or repeat bloom even if we do have a very harsh winter. If they're not all of those things, they're thrown on the burn pile. So he also is in love with viburnum. So those two books, if you're really interested in hydrangeas and viburnums, are excellent sources for some of the good standards. Now, since then, of course, newer and better are always coming along. The others I would not bother with, um, you know, unless you're heavy duty into reference, into plant propagation, you would want that reference manual for propagation. But the DER, the Manual of Woody Landscape Plants, is going to give you plenty of propagation information if you just want to do a little bit of, of it at home. Now, um, in there, he's going to tell you all that stuff we talked about earlier, and he's going to give you a big long list of the different cultivars. Because remember, that's very important. This is oak leaf hydrangea. He'll tell you which ones are prolific bloomers, um, you know, which ones are dwarf, which ones will have double flowers, the size of the bloom panicles, on and on and on. So you want to know that cultivars, as we mentioned, can be very important. Cultivars could be very unusual, like this columnar form of sweet gum called slender silhouette, or it could even be, you know, weeping forms. So you need to know what you're buying. And in there, he's going to cover a whole lot of different ones that you may want to even look at. All right, so that's the book that you want. And if you don't want to spend that much, put it on your Christmas list and make somebody else buy it. I know that, you know, uh, most of the county offices around in uh, Tennessee do have one on hand for you to, you to use as a reference. But books get out of date quickly and we go online. That's just what we do. We got our phone in our hands, we got our computers. We research online what's going on. For as far as I know, Rose Rosette that struck the South several years ago and began wiping out, you know, skadoodles of knockout roses, and it turns out it infects a whole lot of other roses. In fact, there's no rose known that is resistant to it. Um, the reason knockouts got blamed as being the ones most susceptible is we planted gazillions, and some of those were infected with rose rosette, and we didn't know it. They didn't show symptoms. So we spread that all around, up and down Tennessee, and wiped out so many roses when if we hadn't overplanted them, there might not be this onset of this horrible disease for which there is no cure. And I don't see that in books. It's still, all that information is online. UT leads the nation in research on trying to fight back against Rose Rosette. The Wyndham boys, Mark Allen, Wyndham, are both working on this problem. Hopefully one day can create a disease resistant rose. <clears throat> so we go online and online, you're gonna find a whole bunch of people that lie. And they lie by omission. They lie deliberately and they lie because they want to sell you something. So I'm mostly going to avoid those sites that are trying to sell me something and are not regionally um, um, adept about what to recommend. So I know I'm going to look for sites that are like professional organizations. The Urban Forestry Council didn't have any reason to lie to me. They just want to make people better growers of trees. And they will sponsor a lot of times the right trees for Tennessee and recommendations. Large well-founded plant societies, people who love conifers or magnolias or, or, or hostas or, you know, whatever. Hydrangeas, they want you to succeed. We have fantastic, you know, hydrangea society in Memphis. The, we have daffodil societies. These people have no reason to lie to you. They're not trying to sell you a bill of goods. University sites for the most part, but I'm not going to say we're always 100% right. Problem is sometimes old information is still out there, like recommending Leland Cypress for screens. You know, when it first came out in UT pub form, it was a great plant, didn't see a whole lot of ceridium canker on it. But since we planted so many of them, that ceridium canker said, you know what, I think I'll just make Leland's a favorite target of mine. It adapted pretty quickly, and now you're really risking your screen if you plant Leland's. So, but how do we retrieve that information off the internet? This is something where that happens all the time. Can't take bad information down. And sometimes, sometimes my cohorts are wrong. They're still going by old things we were taught in school when new information has proven that is not true. So I hate to call them out, but it can happen. So here's the thing I'm gonna tell you. Don't believe any one site and don't believe me. 
look up a lot of sites that should have good trustworthy information and find the consensus until you feel comfortable. Because I think any one of us is capable of being wrong. Um, I think my daddy always said I was wrong once because if it was because I thought I was. And we would all laugh, but we all kind of think that we're always right. And I know I'm not. All right, so botanical gardens. I love the Missouri Botanical Garden site. That's a good, quick one to give me information I need to know about plant size, especially and things that are useful in the garden. There's a few good industry magazines. Most magazines, um, I say, are more about being pretty and making every plant sound good. I just, what did I just see? One magazine saying, easy to grow from seed, recommended nasturtiums in a magazine. Wow, well, I don't do real well with nasturtiums in my garden, nor sweet pea. I have to get, you know, just the right time of year when the cool temperatures are going to hold out just long enough. So they might be easy in a cooler part of the country, but not here. So mostly I'm going to tell you that magazines, and I, I'm going to qualify this by saying, but I know some of the writers. Some of the writers that I know and trust are going to have great information and some maybe not so much. Now, we're going to move on. I'm going to also tell you that most of the plants that I talk about and recommend will be available locally, not at every garden center, because obviously every garden center can't carry every plant that's available in the trade. If you really want a specific plant, look for it, hunt it down. Um, you can order so much online these days, and there's great catalogs, and there's some good online nurseries. Um, and there's a great that Dave's Garden reviews online nurseries for accuracy, service, and, and vigor. So you, I would also always look that up if I don't know if it's a good online nursery. Uh, but I know there are a bunch that are. So this is Sweetheart Tree or Euscaphus, which is going to be difficult to find locally. But you could find it at a good online nursery like Forest Farm, which is one that I, I like a lot. Um, so remember, you need to shop just like you would if you were looking for a special dress for your niece's wedding, you're not gonna buy the first dress that you see at the first dress store because that's what they had in stock. You're gonna go to several different stores and find that right dress, whether it's cowboy boots, bird dog puppies, I don't care. You gotta find the right store carrying the one you want, not just be sold a bill of goods by the first one you pull in. So remember that. Also, look for quality plants. Cheapest is not always the best. And I will tell you that though I understand nurserymen trying to get a plant to market very quickly because they got kids to feed, they got shoes to buy, um, they are creating some plants that are less than quality now because the name of the game is how fast can I get it to market? So in the old days, our multi stem crepe myrtle, let me see, I think the next picture shows a true multi stem. In nursery management, we were taught the way to produce this true multi-stem crepe myrtle was to stick a cutting in the ground, which it roots quite easily, let it grow for a year or so, then cut it back to the ground. And then when it flushes back up several stems, which by the way, I just did with mine that were killed back at home, uh, usually five to seven, even nine is a good odd number of stems to select and then train them up to this beautiful sculptural tree form where you can enjoy the beautiful winter effect of the sculptural limbs. But now what do they do? Let me go back one. You're sticking three cuttings in a pot and they are pouring the fertilizer and water to them and they're growing a plant that they sell to you as a multi-stem crepe myrtle and it ain't. And just visiting friends at the regional hospital over here last week, they had these painted all up and down the sidewalk in the parking lot um, and in most of those um, planting spaces now, there were two or even sometimes just one crepe myrtle standing. Why? Because it's three trees competing for the same space, competing for nutrients, for water, for sun. And one's going to get crowded out. Sometimes two are going to get crowded out. Now, could you take that and bust it up and have three crepe myrtles and you could leave them single trunked if that's what you want? Yeah, you could, but you're behind on your game a little bit because they're not going to be nice and full because they're crowded. Um, plus, if you wanted a true multi-stem, you could have to cut it down and start over. So it, it's really not a quality plant. And to get a quality plant, you'll have to specify. There's a still grower south of Memphis 
Gosh, Lynn. I know y'all had Lynn speak at y'all's commercial field days there. I'll think of it. Quality crepe myrtle grower who does the old multi-stem. Takes him longer to produce them. So they have to cost more. And a lot of landscape architects, good landscape architects, will specify has to be a true multi-stem crepe myrtle. And it should cost more because you're rewarding that man who grew them or that woman um, because it took longer to get that good plant to market. Let's talk about field grown plants versus container plants. In the old days, there weren't such a thing as plastic containers. They were all grown in the field. They dug them up, they wrapped burlap around the roots and they tied them up with twine. And so they call them ball and burlap because you got a root ball with burlap around it. Or sometimes they just call them B and B. And sometimes they just call them field grown material. Then plastic came along and everybody said, oh, they're so much better than um, these field grown plants. No, not always. And let's talk about the pros and cons. A good field grown plant may grow off faster than a container grown plant. And yes, it can be planted year round if it has been handled correctly, dug and then protected for a while while it adjusts to that new container of burlap um, until it's put, put out some more new roots in that root ball. But if it's been root pruned, which means they're going to actually cut. Now, first of all, let me back up. There's a standard that a quality nursery plant, a field grown plant, should have a foot of root ball for every inch of caliper. Caliper is the diameter there, just as you get above the flare. So let's say that's a three inch caliper trunk. Then that means we should have three feet of root ball. It looks like we did. That's probably a good indicator right there. Now, I'm a grower. I know that actually my roots have flung out several feet bigger than three feet. And if I cut it at three feet, it's going to have uh, most of its, um, it's going to be missing most of its feeder roots, which are out around the perimeter. But I'm a good grower and I want you to get a lot of good feeder roots. So I'm coming along every year with a three foot spade and I'm cutting a root ball that is three feet because every time I cut through those roots, it sends out new feeder roots where I made that cut. Just like when you cut a stem, it sends out new shoots. So when I dig my three foot root ball, man, that root ball's full of good feeder roots. It's a quality plant and avoids that old conundrum we used to talk about that the first year it sleeps, the first year it sleeps, second year it creeps and the third year it leaps because it took three years for it to really regain a root system and take off growing. So um, we have overcome those and these are gonna be really good and fast growing. The problem with is they're heavy. And so they cost a lot of money to transport. And the time of year that we wanna dig them is winter when we have our rains. So that good soil that we put them in that tends to hold together, it's got a certain amount of clay in it so that root ball will stay very nice. Um, is very hard to dig in in the winter months. Shipping, you know, all that plays in. So container plants were better in that we could ship them, we could just drive out onto that gravel pad and lift them up and put them in the truck and they were light and, you know, send them on their way. But, well, first let's talk about the reality of tree roots and we'll get into the container conundrum. Um, we grew up, or when I was in school, we were taught that the tree roots went down very deep and they were kind of a mirror image and they reflected almost the same size of the canopy above ground. It turns out that's not true. I mean, we know it's like the one on the right. I mean, how many trees did we have to see blown over when we realized most all the tree roots are in the top couple of feet of soil and that they go sideways. I remember my old professor used to say, well, that's because we got bad layers in our soil, but no, it turns out that's what tree roots want to do because tree roots like um, air. They don't want to go down deep. They want to go where there's nutrients and air and water and they're, that's where they're going to stay. They're not going to go down in that harsh, unforgiving soil where they don't want to be and there's nothing there for them. So when we prune these roots, we don't have to really go that deep. and We're still going to get a whole lot of good roots. That's the reality of it. Now, if I've been root pruning, my root ball might look like the one on the left. If I hadn't been root pruning, it might look like the one on the right. Now, how do you know? Are you gonna go to a garden center and unwrap their root balls and look at them? No, but a good garden center has. 
when I worked at Zone 7 Garden Center, that was the name of it, down in Starkville, Mississippi, um, if we had a new grower we were purchasing um, B and B plants from, we didn't let them unload until we'd gotten on the truck and unwrapped a few and see, are they good? Do they have good feeder roots or are they just whacked off with no feeder roots? Because that plant on the right is not likely to succeed. Even if it lives, it's going to take forever to really take off growing. And if they weren't any good, we said, no, don't unload. We're not accepting this. You've got to take them back. We eventually knew, you know, who the good growers were and they are going to, we're going to help our customers. We want them to buy good plants from us and succeed. So that's one thing we can do. Um, so ask, you know, ask your, develop that local mom and pop relationship. That's a pretty good one. It's not great, but it's not bad. All right, the problem with container plants. They hit those sides and they start wrapping around, rhymed and winding around. So we have found that that will continue when we put them in the ground if we don't somehow stop that wrapping around and they will girdle and they will eventually do themselves in or can. They don't always, but they do. I was not a believer of that at first, y'all. I thought, big deal, put them in the ground. The roots are going to find purchase. Everything's going to be good until people showed me proof and proof and proof. So now we encourage people, take that. I love that little Corona saw. My favorite is the little seven inch because you can put it in your pocket and it'll cut like crazy through those are cut tree, it cut pretty good sized trees, y'all. Um, and we wanna saw through them, be brutal, knock all that potting soil away from the roots. We don't wanna put that potting soil because growers grow um, in mostly bark these days because bark, it, you can't overwater trees if they're growing in bark because the water's gonna run right through. So they can go ahead and just set that irrigation system to go on you know, every day or every other day for the same amount in the same time. And they know the water's gonna run through and they can not uh, rot their roots if they use good draining soil. So that good draining soil, very porous, barky stuff, do you want that in the ground with your plant? Because then you're gonna have a little pocket of soil that dries out fast from surrounding soils, gonna fill up with water during wet times. No, you want your roots to come in contact with the soil where it's going to grow. So now all the new research tells us, see what you can do to get all that soil away from those roots. Take a good hose, you know, knock it against the edge of the wheelbarrow or the, the shovel and try to get those roots against the soil where it is expected to grow. Do not add soil amendments. Again, we're going to create that pocket of porous soil that's gonna create problems in the long run. That goes against all the things we were taught. And of course, the person at the garden center who's trying to sell you the soil amendments at the checkout stand, bless their hearts. They get a lecture from me when they try to do that to me. Um, Google this, research it. And again, don't trust me. Uh, Google Linda Chalker Scott, who has been doing research on how to best grow off woody plants in the landscape now for many years and has done the research and has the data. Okay, Linda Chalker Scott, garden myths, you know, planting trees, soil amendments, you'll find all this stuff online. And then, you know, research others. I mean, the more modern stuff tells you, you don't want soil amendments and get all the soil away from those roots and that container uh, plants can have problems that field grown plants do not. A lot of people now, especially in the urban forestry realm, tell you they will take a field grown plant any day over a container plant and expect fewer problems if it's a well grown. See, this, this is what happens. I had to see these things. I wasn't convinced. I thought, really? So see how that has wrapped around and they've never gotten out of that root ball where that loose fluffy soil was. It never wanted to get integrated into the native soil. Look at that. And they planted it too deep. See where that flare is? That flare should be above the ground. Trees have a flare before they get to the ground. And that's where it should have been planted. Now these poor roots have come back up to the surface to try to get air. We've got problems, folks. Oh my gosh, look at that. It is absolutely choking this tree. It is cutting off the bark. You know, the bark's where all the the, the um, phloem goes, the cambium layer, all that stuff that transports nutrients back and forth from the top to the roots. And we have created a choking, easy to snap situation here. So 
it's absolutely crucial that you do something to get rid of those circling roots. Look at that one. There's one on the left, should not go down the ground like a telephone pole. It should have been up above the ground. There's, see how those roots came back up. Look at that place where it's gonna snap in the next windstorm. So plant high, keep from gird, the root girdling. And let's just talk for, very quickly about planting. Dig your hole a little bit more shallow than the depth of your root ball. I would rather have my root ball sit a little bit too high than be too low. Especially with things like dogwoods, with like azaleas. They, you know, they need that air exchange. If you ever dug up a dogwood, right in the roots or in the leafy duff, right under the, 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 the layer of leaves and where they get lots and lots of air exchange, they want to be mulched. You know, they, they imitate the forest floor as best you can to succeed with dogwood. So dig it just that depth. Um, and then you can pull soil up to it, you know, to with mulch or whatever to cover the top of that root ball, but leave it a little high. And I think you'll have better success. I just got one of the, you know, there's only a few Southern maples, uh, su sugar maples that do well in the South and Legacy is one. I finally got one for my birthday last year, year before. And I planted it high because the place I wanted to put it, that soil there is, I know a little bit wet um, on the wet side. So I planted it really high and I, I'm about to have to pull up a little bit more soil and mulch over the top right about now, but I'd rather do that. All right, water it in good. Don't say, oh yeah, we're gonna get a rain, it ought to be enough. No, no, no. Put that hose in that hole and make sure that whole hole gets full of water and it burps, and it bubbles. You can see things kind of settle and shift. You can move it around a little bit, you know, to make everything kind of settle around the roots. Don't pack it. You don't want pack soil. I mean, we need air exchange down there, so don't go stomping around it in your boots. Just let the water kind of settle it. Sometimes I'll take a light, you know, fork and kind of help get the, the soil to settle down where it's kind of cloddy or something. But don't, don't pack it. Do not do that. Um, I disagree with putting that plastic collar around it. It's a good idea to protect our tree trunk from weed eaters and mowers, but let's just do it by putting plenty of mulch around it. That's going to harbor pest, uh, rodents or insects that could be problematic on our bark. Um, but other, every, other than that, I like everything about this planting. I guess I'm gonna have to draw up my own drawing because I cannot find one that is absolutely just right. Um, backfill the planting hole with the original soil. Cut the girdling roots. Everything else is good. Have you ever heard this? I had to contend this uh, had a, a garden center guy who had no trust for me in the beginning, but he got where he did and he had to replace a Japanese maple that he had installed twice. And he took me out to the site to see what in the world could be wrong, expensive replacing these big Japanese maples. Well, he had been told, he knew the site was too wet, that if you dug a hole and put gravel down in the bottom of the hole, that then you could plant on a wet site and it would be fine. And I looked at him and I said, Don, if you fill a bucket full of gravel with water, is it not still full of water? I hate to be sarcastic, but it's been my nature and it, it's just true. That is not going to help. Also, people want to pour fertilizer to a new plant or they think when something looks wrong with it, pour the fertilizer to it. You do not want to stress a new plant with a lot of fertilizer. Fertilizers are salty. They draw water from the roots. You don't want to be pushed into new growth when you ain't feeling well or when you're adjusted to a new site, do you? So wait a good full year. Always err on the side of caution. Too little fertilizer is a lot better than too much. So lightly and occasionally, I just like to run out for a rain. You don't need to inject it around the roots. You don't need those deep pegs. I mean, you know, do what Mother Nature does, a light bit on top. And mostly you're only going to need nitrogen. Most of our soils have plenty of phosphorus and potassium. So that's right before a rain, I run out maybe and scatter a little bit. But I, I really don't fertilize very much. I, I use mulch because mulch is going to break down and be natural. It's going to grow at the right rate. When you flush out a lot of new growth, you can create some problems and create the potential for diseases that you might not have, especially with fruit trees. So don't, don't be too happy with fertilizer. I make a little moat to catch the water so that I can, you know, let that water trickle down around the root system. That's good mulching top left where you drop down before you get to the actual tree trunk. 
Um, you see the flare there. Sometimes if it's a slope and you're having a problem with water running off, there's some cute little tricks. You know, you can cut off a big soda bottle and stick it down in there, even a big piece of PVC pipe, if you don't care how it looks, and fill that up with water so that it can trickle slowly down around that root system. And often um, on these trees that I'm starting to get adjusted, usually I have to water them the first year, maybe a little bit the second year. So as I just pull a hose out there and put a good drip on it and uh, leave it on overnight, that's a lot better than you know sprinklers and such and such. <clears throat> Why are some trees so expensive? Again, from a grower standpoint, if you have to grow, let's say a Tamukiyama Japanese maple, which is one of the best red lace leaf weeping, weeping ones for the south, you got to grow a little seedling Japanese maple that's going to be just an ordinary green usually. And then you've got a piece of a Tamukiyama, so you got to find the mother, the cyan wood to a tamukiyama to get the graft wood. Then you got to have skilled labor to do the grafting. Then once that graft takes, you've got to grow it to a sellable size. So you got several years in skilled labor invested in these plants, and you got to get some money for them. So that's why they cost a lot. If you don't like the cost, then go buy something else. I do love Japanese maples. I collect a good many of them. I'm not so much out about the weeping ones. I like the bigger upright forms. Um, in green forms and, and all kind of my friends, the walkers up in Ripley um, will often let us come up and tour their garden. Anybody who's interested, 150 different uh, cultivars of Japanese maple, all labeled and uh, pronounced correctly. And they do let us come and look at their garden. <clears throat> so there's our little green ones. There's nothing wrong with the green Japanese maple because they're almost all gonna have good fall color. And I like the seedlings actually. So there's grafting. And for those of you who just might not be familiar, you're basically sticking two things together and letting them knit together like a bone would heal. And the rootstock can be just a green ordinary, you know, Japanese maple or just a green or just a white ordinary dogwood. And you could graft a pink flower in dogwood. And um, that is important for you to know because if you buy these special cultivars, you need to monitor the graft union. What does that mean? Well, sometimes these things will sprout below the graft union. So if you expect it, here's a, an example of budding. And uh, by the way, this is just a different type of grafting. That bud that you have stuck into that little slice that you took out of the side of this tree, once it's healed in, you're going to cut it off right above that bud. Let me go to the next slide. That bud will shoot out, straighten up, and become the trunk. So every bud has the potential to be an entire tree. All right, so watch that graft union. You'll be able to see where the bark changes color. You can see here that little bitty bud's got a slightly different type of bark than the rest of that tree. See it there on this Japanese maple? So there's a bud that sprouted on the rootstock, the ordinary green Japanese maple. And the red lace leaf one that was what you paid for is that grayer bark up there to your left. Well, you should not let that green part go so long without cutting it off. If you keep an eye on it, you can just rub it off with your thumb before it even gets woody. It's still not too late to cut this off, though now you're going to have a little bit more sprouting to deal with to keep removing. Because if you don't, that green part is going to overtake your red part because it's more vigorous. So same thing if you have a pink dogwood that now is white, you may not have monitored that rootstock and it overtook the pink form, which was not quite as vigorous. So know that about grafted plants. It requires a little bit of attention from the homeowner. Are y'all ready for a break? Tell me, if not, I can go on. <laughs> yeah, let's take a little five minute break. Let's let people stand up and stretch out a little bit and we'll come back in five minutes. It is 740, so 745. Okay, see you there. Um, and as uh, climate has warmed, it's getting closer and closer to the southern border. Now, somebody said, well, of course, if we had drawn the southern border or just a few degrees further south, it would be native. Um, but as it is, it's going to kind of make itself native, which, you know, plants do change. They migrate. Everybody thinks plants, you know, stay put, and, but they're migratory species and they have our, the plants on our continent have changed many, many times over the millions of years, depending on the climate. So nothing, none of that's new. 
Okay. Which nursery carries the most native plants? Well, every nursery has a lot of native plants. That's one of those myths that I hear running around. I love native plants, but I don't like um, the falsehood about native plants, that they're always easier to grow, which isn't true. Um, many are difficult. Uh, the, you know, only native plants provide for insects and wildlife, which isn't true. Um, again, we talk, can talk about other plants on other countries that are very closely related to what we have now and would serve the very same plants. Uh, but any, any garden center you walk into is gonna have oak leaf hydrangea, coneflowers, um, you know, black-eyed Susans, Liatris, Gara, uh, Galardia, Redbuds, Dogwoods, Magnolias. You, you can't walk into a garden center without being surrounded by native plants. All flocks are native. You ever found a garden center that didn't have flocks? Mm -hmm. um, or coneflowers? So I think they, I hate to say it's a financial motive to try to make people believe that native plants are hard to find because they're not. And also don't buy into the fact that cultivars are not good for insects, that somehow they're freaky man-made GMO weirdo things that have no nutritional content because uh, research is ongoing right now that shows that some of these cultivars, which remember are often naturally occurring, just like what would happen in nature, are more nutritious or have longer bloom seasons or don't require any help to succeed, you know, in certain climates. So they're actually better for the wildlife, but you have to judge one. This, this cultivar may be better this cultivar over here, because it's got a whole bunch of double frilly petals, it looks cool, but it doesn't let the insect get into the goodies. So that's a bad cultivar. But this cultivar over here might be good. So what I discourage is blanket statements. You know, lots of plants are good for wildlife. Lots of plants are not. And a lot of native plants are not good for wildlife. The native um, anise tree, Elysium parviflorum, one of my very favorite plants to recommend for screening because it'll go in sunshade, wet or dry. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. In fact, is toxic to wildlife, but it's native. So I don't really understand uh, sometimes why people don't see this. It's very obvious if you know plants that natives are easily found and that there are good natives and not so good natives and that there are good non-natives and not so good non-natives. So we judge each plant on its own merits um, in my world. Okay, uh, let's get one more. What are some good catalogs? Well, if you're looking for cool perennials and even some, you know, the smaller woody shrub-like things, what I might call sub shrubs, uh, Plant Delights is a fantastic source. Um, Tony A. Bent up in North Carolina. Some people think his plants are too expensive, uh, but he has, you know, this enormous collection of cool plants that you're not going to find anywhere, and he trials them there in his uh, Raleigh, North Carolina garden, and it can tell you all about their cultural conditions and, and good habits. I say I don't think he's expensive for what we get, because in the old days, if you wanted a cool new plant, then you might have to get a ship, hire a ship, a captain, a botanist, wait a couple of years for them to come back with something good. And then hopefully you get a cutting when some of it managed to grow big enough for you to get a cutting. So, you know, to pay 15 to $25 for a rare, uh, and he does a lot of great natives as well. Uh, again, traveling around the country, he'll see special forms of mutations of natives that he collects and propagates and sells. Um, then I think he's well worth the money to keep him in business. It's an, he's an, got an amazing collection of plants. For Woody's, I mentioned Forest Farm, um, which is a really good one for a wide range of different Woody plants. I like them because they are accurate. A lot of times you order stuff online, it's not what it said it would be. And also because they have several different growing areas across the country. So, you know, I know that they will have plants that have that will do well in the south. Number one, I know which plants are going to do well in the south, but uh, when we think about where they come from, did they grow them at a region that's locally adapted? Um, 
what, was, what was the second one that you talked about that was high priced maybe forest farm and it's the, the really one before that catalog. it's about the size of a paperback if you want to order it in in you know paperback form it's a great little reference to carry along with me on trips it's like my dur replacement because i don't want to pack my big heavy dur maybe in my overnight bag but it's also got a good online um, which uh, one thing I love about Tony's, his website online is, is very good. I discovered um, a really good one, believe it or not, on Amazon. It's called New Life Nursery. And I was Googling around because I've gotten to be a bit of an osmanthus collector. And I was trying to find some of these rare forms of osmanthus. And uh, an Amazon site popped up. And also a special form of cryptomeria I've been looking for called Black Dragon. And they had that. So I took a risk and... I mean, all the reviews were good, and sure enough, I got a nice chunky plant for the price I would have expected to pay at a local garden center um, of plants I couldn't find otherwise. So it's all you know risky, and I, and there's you know more. A lot of times it just depends on what you're looking for. Um, you know, there are certain places that specialize in native azaleas, for example. Uh, there's one over in East Tennessee. I can't come up with the name right now. If it's Magnolias, I, I love Gosslers, G-O-S-S-L-E-R-S. -S so I kind of have to know the plant and I can probably direct you to the right catalog. Okay. I think you're good. You can go for it. And I will say Proven Winners does a pretty good job of their plants being ones that are proven to be well adapted across most of the country. I won't say that 100%, but the vast majority of them, Proven Winners does a good job of trialing plants across the country before they earn the Proven Winner status. And, and I actually know the guy that used to direct that. He's retired, and I know Rick was very conscientious about that being not just a plant that looked good in the catalog. It had to perform. By the way, most of these catalogs lie by omission, um, I'm going to call one out. White Flower Farms advertised white oak as being rare and wanted to charge a premium. It's not. And then they also really advertised the heck out of mountain ash. Mountain ash is a sorbus, not really a true ash, which is fraxinus. About its great beauty. Oh, it had spring flowers, white flowers. It had great fall color. It had brilliant red fruit. All that is true, but it won't live once you get below 3,000 feet of altitude. You get it out of the mountains and it's going to get fire blight. It's in Rosaceae family. And that sucker will not live uh, once you get it below 3,000 feet. They didn't mention that. I mean, a lot of catalogs do that. Do I, do I seem indignant? I am. That's why I always check my dirt. I have dirt here. I have dirt at home. This is, you know, you got to have your dirt. So read up about it before you order anything. Research it. We do that with cars. We do that with washing machines. We need to do it with plants. And you do keep up with us, right? What does well at the trial gardens? You do UT Gardens Knoxville to see what we've evaluated, all the plants that we've written up over the years for a plant of the month as good performers for Tennessee. I hope you, you know, research all that. That is local. Um, I've been with UT 25 years. Jason's been here 15 or more. Uh, a lot of people in Knoxville that write some of it have been here now for many years. So we um, have accumulated a vast body of knowledge that is yours to access anytime. Can I go on now or we still got more? I'm glad to answer more. Uh, we can move on. One more? We can move on. Okay. All right, so what do we do under our trees? We'll move quickly. We'll try to finish on time. Now this is what would happen out in the wild. We would have this natural ground cover and leaf duff going on. So instead, a lot of times we try to grow grass right up next to those trees and that's just a huge mistake. Um, 
number one, some some trees don't care about competing with turf grass. I mean, a willow oak is such a cheerful citizen. It's going to grow out there in the hot sun and compete with turf grass, but a dogwood might not. It's, it's going to go, no, 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 I need cool roots. I need lots of mulch, need lots of air. But any tree is going to succumb to damage, right? If we knock off too much bark, it's not going to make it. As soon as if we even knock off a little bark, then we're inviting borer. So it's going to weaken the tree and it's going to go down, especially if one it's one of those that's a little bit picky. So let's do everything we can to keep uh, mowers and string trimmers away from the tree. And I know we drive, we try to drive those mowers carefully. There's that one time we're going to, this is no longer what we want you to do. We do want you to maybe put ground covers under the trees or just mulch. But English ivy, it turns out, has become such a horrible um, performer and far that it just takes over. It's just too aggressive. It's going to climb up in your trees. It's going to get loose out in the woods and take over woodlands and choke out trees there. Eventually it climbs up in trees and takes over so much that it shades out the foliage and we need foliage, right, to make photosynthesis for the tree to survive. But even worse, it makes that tree more susceptible to wind throw. So a gust of wind has all that heavy evergreen foliage that catches the wind and causes it to pitch over. So we really discourage using English ivy as a ground cover. I use English ivy now only in containers on my deck for green, evergreen, you know, interest throughout the winter months. It has to be in a contained situation or it's not coming to my house. <clears throat> we see here we have to fight it all the time, try to keep from climbing this um, Madison County champion ginkgo that's right out here behind the parking lot. So as we think ground covers are a solution, right? We're going to plant this ground cover under here. We don't have to worry about then anything on there. Uh, this is Vinca major. Again, it's an invasive. It'll, here's contained. It's not going to get away from this planting. But yeah, that Vinca major had growing in it because of the birds up in the tree that were pooping in, into it. Had poison ivy, Chinese privet, um, wild grape, um, ch uh, wild cherry, there were eight different weeds growing in this ground cover. And to weed that ground cover has to be done by hand. There is no chemical you can spray over the top. It's gonna to kill all those broadleaf weeds. It isn't gonna kill your vinca major. So everybody that thinks ground cover is a quick and easy solution under trees or on slopes, wrong. I have whole programs on what you need to do. I prefer plants that don't run, that don't get aggressive and um, are hard to, to manage the weeds in. Why are you doing that to me? Here we go next. Instead, I just think of under trees as being a shade garden. And I use plants that like that shade in discrete clumps. They're not aggressive. I can weed among them if I need to, though I love to plant them crowded because the more crowded your plants are, the fewer weeds you're gonna have because we know that that sunlight striking the soils which stimulates a lot of these weeds to germinate. So just think about that as a, a place to do your hostas, hydrangeas, azaleas, um, ferns, etc., and like we did it under Jimmy's, right? The, so there's probably not going to be much weeding carried on in there. Not to mention weeding's easier in the shade. Moss makes a great ground cover. Garden Zoe Bay. If you can find an open date to go visit Garden Zoe Bay and walk around and look at the mossy paths and above the leaves under the trees, and then use those to plant trees, shrubs, ferns, etc. Um, another no mow uh, landscape. My friend Robin. Um, brown over in Nashville area where everything under the trees is just mulched and planted. They're, they're not trying, they're not asking them to compete with turf grass. Moss is a great look, you know, go with it. Takes more traffic than you think. And this at least mulch under trees and this mulch out as far as we're willing, you know, it'd be great if you went out to the edge of the canopy. What I like to do is plant trees in groups and mulch that whole area as a grouping and then plant among them the shade loving shrubs and perennials that I enjoy. And, you know, a few annuals I throw in there every, well, every year as well, because I love shopping, love trying new plants. So this mulch is done properly. We've dropped back down to the tree before we get to the trunk. We don't want to pile mulch up against that trunk. Um, I am not a fan. I just took a great picture, Dave, I forgot to put it in, of landscape fabric under mulch because it always slides off. Weeds grow through the mulch and into the landscape fabric. And then you have a terrible time trying to get those weeds out. I was walking into, uh, uh, my friend has been in and out of the hospital and I was actually at two different hospitals, but the Lexington hospital had a big bed of 
shrubbery out front with landscape fabric, just horrible and weeds growing all through it. Everybody who's ever tried it wishes they hadn't. So please don't, and especially don't use plastic because that also has the same horrible, messy, terrible habits, um, but it also obstructs air exchange to the roots. Let's talk about the, the evils of staking. Don't stake unless you just have to, if that tree's just falling over and falling over. I finally had to succumb. I had transplanted a little gym magnolia and it was catching the wind. Because trees that can't move in the wind will not build up strength, what we call uh, taper, which is how much the tree is wide at the bottom as compared to how skinny it is at the top. Trees with great taper are very wind firm. If you look at a common bald cypress, it's got great taper, very wide at the bottom as compared to the top. Well, that requires movement to build up, it's like building up your muscles. When you move, your muscles build up. If you were tied up to be straight and not be allowed to move, when they took the, the chains off you, you're gonna flop too. So don't, unless you, if you have to, it's just not all the anchoring things I'm fixing to show you in a minute aren't working at the bottom. Be sure you leave them loose enough to move um, and then put those, be sure you protect the bark with something soft. Some people use pantyhose, some people, I don't know who wears pantyhose anymore, use hoses and anchor, uh, strap it to the tree as low as you can so that it can still move and build up some taper. All right, but I'd rather see you do this and this is in your book. If you have hopefully read the, the Woody Plant chapter that I wrote, I will brag did was a national award winner. Um, but I was told to do this and I wish I could give him credit because I don't remember who told me this. And we would do this when we were planting trees on a playground to anchor that tree. These were some pretty good sized trees going in. So the kids wouldn't be tripping over the guy wire that they could play and not get hurt. We hammered rebar all the way down into the ground. We basically nailed the root ball into solid earth and it worked great and anchored those. Guy called me back years later. He said, I use that all the time now. I'm so proud that you told me how to do that. Now, if it's a tree that won't stay anchored, you could try bigger. Uh, I don't use rebar anymore because I don't like leaving metal in the ground for somebody else to run across with a piece of machinery. I use long wooden tomato stakes I get at the feed store or if it's a really big tree and I need long, I got a hammer deep down in the good ground. I'll go cut little skinny saplings out in the woods and leave a pointed end and hammer them down into the ground. I'm nailing that root ball at crisscross angles, not straight up and down, because straight up and down is gonna blow out easy. You don't nail a board straight onto the barn because the wind can blow it off. You nail at angles to make sure that board stays pinned to that barn. This could work too, if it's a big wide root ball and it's not staying anchored, hammer you know four posts down deep into that ground and then put other posts across that root ball that hold it down. Sometimes we've had to do that with bigger trees. Uh, up at uh, Jason's mother's, we had to do this with some trees. Um, so there's a lot of ways to do it without those dangerous stakes. And I say dangerous because you and I could trip over them, but also they can damage that tree. Just looked at a whole row of red maples over here next to an apartment complex that were dying last summer. Um, turning red in July. And it's because nobody ever took the stakes off and they were cutting into the girdling the trunk. More than half the trees in, in that parking lot were goners. All right, so we, we've talked about all this. I'm not gonna go there. Please don't ever do this. Uh, topping trees is evil, bad. No, it does not need rejuvenating pruning. You can prune a tree, but you always cut back at the collar. Follow the limbs back to the trunk or to the next big limb, when you are through pruning a tree properly, there will be no stubs. This tree is panicked now. It has no foliage. It's sent out a million little shoots to try to make food. And those are so shallowly attached that they're just gonna blow out of there. We have created, stubs can't heal. So rot's gonna go right down those stubs and get to that tree trunk. So you have doomed that tree by topping, by improper pruning. You can remove limbs properly. This is a properly pruned tree. They went all the way back to the trunk or to the next big limb and they cut it right at that collar, which is where the tissue is that can properly heal and that tree is, is gonna stay healthy. So remember that and use it in every way, every shrub, every small tree. So these Japanese maples, let's say these limbs were getting in your way on the sidewalk. Well, don't cut them back to little stubs 
get the limb that's bothering you and follow it back to the trunk and remove it. Crape myrtle limb scraping on the house, get that limb, follow it back to the trunk and remove it there. You'll retain the grace and you won't have to prune anymore once you get it up and over. So, okay, we're gonna go by function now. I'm gonna go fast. We know I have lists for all this, right? So we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time on each tree. I'm just gonna talk about some characteristics and a few of my favorites and we're gonna move pretty quickly. So did somebody ask a question? I heard a voice. Okay. We wanted to be fast. We wanted to be clean to live under. We wanted to be strong wooded. So we, those are what we uh, look for in a shade tree. Now let me talk about this for a minute. When I talk about shade trees, I mentioned I grew up in a house that was covered with shade. And we know that the number one way for us to reduce cooling bills and reduce our carbon footprint from running our air conditioner is to provide shade on the house. So everybody's scared, right? We've had tornadoes. We had the, the Hurricane Elvis a few years ago in Memphis that took down hundreds of thousands of trees. So if you want shade on the, on the house, you know, you're certainly going to risk that there could be store damage. How can we reduce that risk? For one thing, we plant a lot of trees. It sounds counterintuitive, but the more trees you plant, the safer you are. Because the trees on the outer perimeter are gonna help break up that wind before it gets to the trees that could fall on the house. But more importantly, think about if we were to peel that grass back, what we would see, and that is a network of roots, because all those roots by now have spread over to each other, they're intermingled, they're helping anchor each Whereas a single tree out by itself in the lawn, that big saucer of roots, once that soil gets soggy and it catches a gust of wind, boom, it's going to go over. Here, they're all helping to hold each other down. So remember that um, more trees are better. Also remember there's a certain distance from the house that is most dangerous. And it's not always the one that's closest because trees don't have time to gain speed as they fall, because all of us have seen trees go down, whether we were cutting them down or we just watched them go down in a storm, they start very slowly. And they don't really gain momentum until that 45 degree where they go, pull. So think about that when you place them. A few closer to the house could actually protect from some of the other trees. See here, this one was starting to fall, but the roof caught it before it really inflicted a whole lot of damage. Whereas this one, was just the right distance to really gain that momentum. Certain trees are less likely to cause damage simply because of their growth habits. So we have a tree that has a main central trunk, our cypress tree, our dawn redwood. Um, that tree never forms great big massive limbs like an old oak might. So if the limbs blow off of this tree, they're not gonna cause, cause a whole lot of damage. Plus it's presenting less resistance to the wind, right? We don't have that, that enormous mass. Um, also, the number one tree you wanna plant if you are afraid of damage to the house is our common bald cypress. And just of course happened to be my mother's favorite shade tree, but you do research, which by the way, Plato Tuliatis, famous nurseryman we no longer have in Memphis, rest in peace, uh, one of the best teachers I've ever had. He did his research on trees that stood up to hurricanes. You can Google around and find um, wind firm trees and Google Plato Tuliatis's name and you'll find his research from when he was in school in the 1970s. And common bald cypress don't blow over. They don't. Why? Because of that buttress. Look at that buttress. Look at that flare. Look at that taper. And those roots, roots run out forever from a bald cypress. Not deep, but wide, 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 way out. It can't blow over. Top might snap out in a hurricane, but guess what? Top's not very big because of that growth habit. So you might lose the tops, but that sucker ain't gonna blow over on you. If you ever see one blowing over, I've hunted for photos. Please send me the photo, take a photo. They just, they just don't. Now remember every tree in the swamp isn't a common bald cypress. These are um, water tupelo, um, um, Nisa aquatica. Um, Nisa sylvatica is black gum. These are called Tupelo gum, and they're the reason Tupelo, Mississippi is called Tupelo. They're uh, not favored so much as a great tree as the cypress, though the, the beaver love them. They always hollow them out and, 
and uh, often swim up in there. And, and swamp rabbits will even use them for shelter. I think common bald cypress is underpriced for its fall color. It has a beautiful golden cinnamon fall color. Uh, and there's a lot of things to like about the tree. I do love the old American elms, one of your fastest growing shade trees, and they do have new introductions now that are disease resistant. Now, I'm not gonna tell you right now that I'm really crazy about any of them because we had some going along fantastic here at the station and one of them succumbed to elm yellows, which is a different disease. But at home, I have planted some and I'm evaluating them. Uh, one has already snapped in a windstorm, but the rest are holding up. So I have to give you that report in a few years, but they are available now in the trade and I still do love an American elm. A lace bark elm was one of my favorites to recommend. They're the biggest and oldest ones that I know of that I've ever photographed in the whole country are in Memphis. They're in Memorial Gardens. Uh, once you pull in the main entrance there off of Poplar, turn left as soon as you can and you will see a big group of old lace bark elms right there. Uh, they're strong wooded, they're quite beautiful, they don't have litter issues, and there's a reason they're called lace bark elm, right? So fantastic for the winter interest. There's a golden form that I sought out um, called Golden Ray, and I did order that one from Forest Farm. It was on, Forest Farm it was only $15, but it was $35 for the shipping, but well worth it, right? Well, uh, I'm gonna recommend um, is a great, you know, one of our better uh, adaptable oaks that's going to grow fairly rapidly for an oak. Um, not, you know, avoid the, the pin oak, the um, Quercus palustris, get the willow. Willow oaks line many, many streets across the south, south still, and we still can consider that a durable tree. But remember, I wouldn't do this because something might come along and target willow oak and we would be wiped out. So diversify, diversify, diversify. I like a scarlet oak. I like, um, actually it's a little easier to grow our nutall oak and schumard. And nutall was one of our fastest growing native red oaks in unirrigated trials in McManville. Both of them have good, decent fall color, beautiful big round oval, good shade trees. So nutall and schumard are very good. And swamp chest, I don't remember one more, I'm gonna recommend one more oak. And by the way, these are all examples of native plants that are gonna be easily found in many nurseries locally that don't have to be just native uh, nurseries. Swamp chestnut was Plato Tuliatis' favorite. He called it the cow oak because it's such big sweet acorns that even cows would graze on them in winter back in the olden days before you had uh, cow feed stores and such. So it makes a nice big beautiful tree with good fall color. Here it is at Chica Wood showing off that gorgeous echo with the, the year they had the Chihuly exhibit. Chestnut leafed oaks, which is, there's there several of them in the, in the chestnut leaf group, are white oaks. And those acorns, when you pick them up, can be planted immediately. They will put down a root as soon as they fall, once they hit moisture. And um, the roots will grow all winter long and come spring, the shoots will start. There's a lot of upland oaks. And I used to live in lowland oaks and now I'll wander around and look at the upland oaks. Sawtooth is a really good one that's not native but it's the, one of the faster growing oaks. And it's gonna give you a very wide spread, like tiger on a limb um, growth habit um, that I find very appealing. It looks kind of like a live oak that will actually grow up in Tennessee, though it's not evergreen. Sawtooth fall color, sawtooth cutest acorns in the world. We have some in our parking lot, we really like them. Now, cultivars in oaks can be interesting. This is also Memorial Gardens, y'all. I want you to go look because this is a form of white oak. Um, it's an English oak, which is a type of white oak um, that naturally occurs from seed to stay columnar. Not every seed, three out of four seeds will be this shape. So if you wanna go collect acorns off this at Memorial Gardens and plant them, then you can select the ones that are gonna have this nice columnar form. Um, they were prone to a little bit of powdery mildew, so now they have crossed them with some of our other native white oaks, uh, like Quercus uh, lorata, the overcup oak. And now we have ones that don't get powdery mildew, and we've got a big collection of them out here uh, planted along our driveway. I hope you'll come over sometime and see. We've got columnar trees of every species you could imagine, because we just love them. Red maple used to be a staple, and I'm gonna warn you about them. We loved red maples because they grew fast. The nurserymen could get them turned over quickly and get them to market. They grew fast in your landscape. They had good, reliable fall color. They would take 
you know, all kinds of different soils, including those that were too wet, because this is a bottomland species that also did great on up as, oh, it was good, it was good, and we planted it, and we planted it, and we planted it. Guess what? A little insect that only occasionally targeted red maple adapted and said, you know, I'll just make red maple a favorite. So now our entomologist Frank Hale says, don't plant a red maple in Tennessee unless you're willing to plant to pour the neonicotinoids, the long time residual insecticides in the hole when you plant it to protect it right away. Because it's always right when they're recently planted and somewhat stressed that they're gonna get flat headed apple borer. And that borer can be controlled by the imatocloprid but I always tell people, I don't want to have to treat anything. It isn't that I'm trying to be an organic angel as much as I want to plant something else that I just don't have to. I don't have to be concerned about whether or not I'm doing anything bad. Um, if I only had one big shade tree and I was trying to preserve it from an insect, I might use a pesticide on it for the good it did, but I'm going to avoid putting ones in that I have to treat in order for them to succeed. That's just my philosophy. So I get asked to come look at all these trees that were done on a brand new street tree, big grant over in Linden, Tennessee. I got out of the car, I sat it across on the other side is where the office is. I said to um, the agent there, well, it's flat-headed apple borer. And she said, gosh, you've got good eyesight. I said, no, it's a newly planted red maple. And we walked over and looked at it. And there we are with the bark flaking off. And there are the engraving that's the sign that it is flat-headed apple borer. So I recommend they go back in there with the diverse uh, types of trees. Sapsuckers make holes, don't worry about them. Some people think these are pests, but they're actually friendly little woodpeckers. They don't do the tree any harm. And uh, hummingbirds will actually drink this sap as they come north if there's not enough flowers blooming. And I saw my first hummingbird today. Everybody around me has been bragging, bragging, bragging but I finally got him today. I saw him a iridescent throated little male. Um, Don Redwood has that same growth habit. It's faster growing than common bald cypress. And as you might expect, they're not quite as strong wooded. Um, it was once native to North America. We know of from fossil record, it disappeared, thought it was extinct. It was rediscovered in China just after World War II and those seeds were brought back to the United States. And I always like to kind of pose this question to people, does that mean we have planted um, an Asian exotic or does that mean we have restored a native? Because when you think about time, there's really no such thing as native. Um, even the Native Americans came over the Bering S S Beringia, you know, when the Bering Sea was actually land bridge. So everything got here from somewhere else at some point in time. I love the Don Redwoods though, and this form is a golden form, Ogon and Gold Rush, and then I just bought one called Amber Glow that I put, and they kind of like the wetter spots in my landscape. I'm expecting big things out of that. Tulip poplar, our, uh, our, our state tree can be a good shade tree if it's snug. A lot of times they'll get a scale that drips sooty mode. I like to have them out away from the house so I don't need to worry about that because of the flowers. And you can tell by looking at that flower, it's in the same family as magnolia. And when they bloom in late spring, that's when you want to look for the Baltimore Oreos up in the treetops because as they migrate through, they feed on that orange nectar in those flowers. And I'm a little bit of a birder, not a heavy duty birder, but a little bit. Is a crane bird a tree or a shrub? Well, it depends on the cultivar, right? I said, if you fall out of it and die, then it's probably a tree. If it falls on you and kills you, it's a tree. So there are tree forms. This is the Japanese crepe myrtle used to breed some of our nice big ones like Sarah's favorite and like, um, oh, what's the one I mentioned earlier, Natchez. And then we got understory trees and there's a skadoodle of those and we don't have, we're gonna have to start cutting, cutting off our time. Uh, Japanese maples really would like a little bit of shade here in the deep south. Uh, you go up to Oregon, they're thrilled to death to be in full sun, but not here. There's a handful that, that can, but honestly, if we find them that little bit of afternoon shade, we're going to find a whole lot less leaf scorch and canker that can occur from stress. Green forms are usually more sun tolerant. This is an upright lace leaf green form called Sire U. Um, and these are all, by the way, in Ripley at my friends, the walkers. So let me know if you've got a big interest in Japanese maples and that low mounding one, the green one on there on the ground, it's like a shrub, that's a Japanese maple. 
uh, they will allow us to come. They've redone all this now and it's fabulous. They're great, great people. Just a few more shots. All of those are in your book, by the way. All right, so other ones we could grow in that lower canopy include dogwood, red bud, fringe trees. The magnolias are surprisingly shade tolerant, especially sweet bay. It's where we find magnolias, the native magnolias as we drive south. Um, silver bells, uh, pawpaws, which will make big colony, but are our largest North American fruit and the host plant for the uh, Tennessee state butterfly. I love the hop horn beans, so did Plato and the horn beans, and then some of the service berries. So all these could go under your larger trees. You think in, in canopy layers, especially when you're providing for wildlife, not all birds nest high in the tree. Some like lower trees, some like shrubbery, some nest on the ground beneath the shrubbery, like brown thrashers would crawl under here and nest um, either in the very lower branches or on the actual ground. So let's talk about now little green shrubs. I know um, that's a mainstay and I'm not really sure why we've gotten in this habit of wanting a whole lot of little green mounds in our landscape. You know, my friend fell to rushing and fell a Mississippian calls it the meatball syndrome. And we see shrubs that look like meatballs and lozenges and, you know, popsicles and mushrooms. And this one will stay naturally this shape. This is our dwarf yo pine. And I found it to be a much more tolerant plant then maybe some of those boxwoods are going to require very good drainage. So if you want a little green shrub that's going to stay compact and tight without shearing, get one of the dwarf yo pines. There's several, Schiller's Dwarf, Bordeaux, bunches of them. The boxwoods can be a little bit more picky. Uh, people tend to do terrible things to their boxwoods. They want to prune things in fall. Don't prune anything in the fall. Don't prune any of your woody plants the, after August and put your pruners away and don't prune again until late winter. This should have been pruned, uh, stop in August because then that new growth will have time to harden off. Then prune again, right at the, if you need to reduce size, prune at the end of winter so the new growth can come out and not get burnt by freeze. So, um, and this is one of the sun tolerant forms. You have to know which boxwood you want. And there's a whole bunch of different things about boxwood for them to succeed. I'm not against boxwood. I'm against boxwood in the hands of gardeners who don't know what they're doing and who don't know how to properly site them. This is our old common box. It's some people, the English garden type, some people call American box. There's nothing American about it. And it would actually prefer in our climate, a little bit of shade and certainly protection from the winter winds. And they have to have very good drainage, a lot of things. Anyway, we'll get through. Here they are dying. I see a lot of them dying. They're planted in the wrong place. Hellera hollies. I feel the same when I'm telling you what not to plant. The Japanese hollies. Oh, they look great in a container and almost never again. Hellera, soft touch, compacta. Um, watch them dying all, all around. I don't know why garden centers even sell them because it has to be the one they replace most often. The sky pencil I'll occasionally use like in a container or on a high spot because I want sometimes a shade tolerant upright shrub that's not going to get too big, but it's going to be very carefully sighted. Now I mentioned the yopine. There's a mini good, a good dwarf nandina. And don't let the nandina naysayers tell you that there's no good nandina. Uh, number one, the poison berry thing. That happened once. Um, frost had increased the cyanide content of those Nandina berries, and they were cedar wax wings that just stuffed themselves. You watch them. They strip a whole holly. They stripped a whole bunch of Nandina, and as any farmer knows, there are certain plants that frost will suddenly, a lot of plants have a little bit of cyanide in them, and it increases the cyanide content, and it can kill cows. So they were stuffing on cyanide enhanced Nandina berries and died one occasion, period. And now it was like, if you plant Nandina berries, then you're killing birds. The other problem is that they can reseed in the woods. That's true. I've seen that not often and not much. As long, much as they've been around, there should be a whole lot of them. So if that's your concern, cut the berries off or choose these cultivars that don't make berries. There's a whole lot of them out there now that are sterile, that don't make berries. Um, Harbor Dwarf, Gulf Stream, Lemon Lime, Flirt, there's gazillions. So look for those sterile forms, reward those breeders. See how pretty they can be? This is Lemon Lime. I love that chartreuse color. 
And it's one of my favorites to use in the landscape to put against darker plants for that pop. I will tell you, especially in Memphis, you can grow rosemary as a, as a little green shrub. Get the hardy forms, um, what we've had best luck with all across the state, even in Knoxville, uh, are the form called ARP, A-R-P, extremely hardy, been in Knoxville 20 something years. And then Salem has been my favorite of the hardy we've grown here. And uh, my friend Jeannie is a bit of a snob about culinary rosemary. She says ARP tastes terrible, I can't tell the difference. She said Salem is her favorite of the hardy ones. So Salem would be a good choice. As long as it's got plenty of sun and good drainage, um, it's a fabulous plant. Why wouldn't you want one out around your pool or your grilling area, right? To use and making a, I wonder, love to make marinades for my um, flank steak, for example. A lot of little good abelias out there. Abelias aren't native, but they don't spread either. They don't reseed and they bloom, my goodness, from late spring till frost. Butterflies love it, hummingbirds love them. They're tolerant of a wide range of soil. Bunch of cultivars out there, grab them up. I'm not a fan of these, right? Now they're looking horrible all over Jackson because of the cold winter. Plus they get in a mesporium leaf spot. And I kind of, I'm petty and I'm glad when they get killed by a cold winter because I told people not to plant them. Hope they replace them with something else. And a lot of little dwarf conifers, there's gazillions. We have a pretty good collection of conifers here of, that are heat tolerant. Dwarf conifers can be very expensive and the slower they grow, the more expensive they are. So if you wanna pay a couple hundred dollars for a little plant, it's gonna be big as your fist all its life. That's what you want to do is join the Dwarf Conifer Society. It's weird. A conifer that stays low and works as a great ground cover and few plants stay the same height as predicted. And those are going to be plants that get to a certain height and then start spreading sideways. Because any plant, even if it says dwarf or compact, it only means it's going to get too big slower. Because as long as it's growing up, it's gonna keep growing up. Even dwarf yopine is towering over my head in certain landscapes. Um, so look for those that have a sideways growth habit. At least you can predict the height. So they're gonna keep growing in width as well, but that's a little easier to hide the pruning cuts back under the uh, foliage so that you can't tell that you've done any pruning. I'm nuts about the new distilliums, uh, Vintage Jade, Blue Cascade, you, that's on the upper right. Distilliums can come in big um, evergreen shrubs too for screening use, like Copper Tone is one, Linebacker, don't you love that name, is a big one. But these Vintage Jade and Blue Cascade will grow sideways. There's a lot of good evergreen viburnums that aren't used heavily in this part of the country. When you go to somewhere else, it's a very common landscape shrub. So on the left, you see one called Kanoi, which is an excellent, and viburnums are so tolerant, sun or shade, flowers, you can, you know, evergreen glossy foliage, Kanoi, or if you can find Pearlific, that's a newer form that's out there. Sideways forms of Laura Petalum. We can't get Purple Pixie to live, but Crimson Fire has been great for us, and there's some new ones out there right now. There's a couple of the distilliums, you can see the different growth habits. As for screens, I know we're getting pressed on time. Remember, we just finished our brand new screen publication. It's available at uthort.com. I don't want you to do this because that beautiful row of Spartan junipers, which is a great plant, could get a disease and you'd lose the whole screen planting. Or if one died, lightning strikes one, you got, you got a hole in your tooth. It's going to look like it's going to say, there's a hole. There's a hole here. So don't do this, and it's boring. We don't wanna go there. So we wanna avoid certain plants we used to use for screen plantings, right? We mentioned Leland's. The old red tip Fatinias, it turned out that they began to develop in a Mesporium leaf spot. There's still a few out there, and there's still some that are apparently resistant in a Mesporium, and there have been some selections made uh, from those, so they may be available in the trade, but right now, I can't tell you what they are and that I can guarantee that they're resistant. So I'm gonna tell you not to plant red tip potinias or Leland cypress and green giants are being overplanted. They were touted as a great replacement for Leland. So what did those people do? They went out, took out the whole row of Leland's and put in a whole row of green giants. No, 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 let's mix it up. 
just more interesting anyway, different shapes and colors and textures and even hardy palms, you know, we can grow needle palm and Chinese windmill palm across Tennessee, except up in the very coldest parts and hollies. Um, some can be formally sheared, some not. You can use some fence in there and some stone, make it look good from the road and from the house, you've got a privacy screen. Here's one that the privacy screen between this house and the next is the backdrop for all their colorful seasonal material. How clever is that? Even in a small, you just got a little courtyard and living in a condo, still mix it up. Here's your little privacy screen that's going to give you rosemary for cooking and some nice colorful conifers. We have a mixed tapestry screen demonstration here at the station so that we planted a good dozen different plants in there that can be used here in West Tennessee. Of course, if I'm doing a bigger screen, I'm probably gonna plant three little gem magnolias, you know, and um, five of the anise tree or whatever, but I'm not gonna do onesies. We just did onesies because of the space economy here. I avoid cherry laurel now. I loved bright and tight cherry laurel because I've seen so much peach tree borer on it. I still love a Southern wax myrtle and this has been limbed up, but if you let it go, it'll be a nice big evergreen shrub that smells like bayberry candles, fantastic. And one of my very favorite recommendations is a big evergreen uh, viburnum called Prague, like the city of Prague. These are all in the handout, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay with them too long, but it's gonna bloom for you like a you know, viburnum will. And the smaller magnolias that you, you couldn't use one of the great big ones probably if your landscape's not huge, but little gem that continues to bloom and a teddy bear is one that doesn't, but it's cute. And this is my favorite holly. It was also Plato's. And he's the one who, I guess, created my love for it. It's called lusterly holly. Doesn't it look like a magnolia? But it's a fantastic deep green, not picky about soil holly and it's child, Mary Nell. And then the fosters, the fosters are still good. Also be aware there's a lot of good junipers that could be used for screens. Um, the ones that say four to six feet, sometimes on the tag, you can usually double or triple that. Gray owl, I often see seen labeled as that size. Gray owl, Holbert, Angelica Blue, they can all be eight, 10, 12 feet tall and wide. You've got some great specimens actually there around the ag center of gray owl. And the Ely Agnes, the one that's still legal here to sell in the state, the Ely Agnes of Benji Owl, the other have been um, made illegal to sell and produce because of their uh, potential for being invasive. I love the variegated forms. Um, I think they're splendid plants and beautiful and big floral arrangements. Great for weddings, as my sister-in-law will attest. I don't recommend pines because you're just going to end up with a trunk and a top knot, except this one, um, Virginia pine, because Virginia pine is shrubby and dense. It's not going to, you know, topple like those big loblollies. Um, these are all over the mile in Arsenal Field, and Virginia Pine's a great little pine. It succeeds on dry, hot sites. And some of the big lower petalum can be mixed in with your screen. Now, a hard winter can knock foliage off. It did this winter, but they come back out if you'll just give them a minute. Uh, then you get pink flowers in spring and then the different burgundy foliage, and especially we like to recommend the one called Juju Fuchsia. That's on your handout. Gray owl. Our, our eastern red cedars, which are actually a juniper, there's some been selected now for special shapes and growth habits. So if you thought you wanted an Italian cypress and somebody lied to you and told them, told you they were hardy and they're not, then replace them with this, which is Taylor juniper. It's an eastern red cedar that we know is hardy here and it's gonna look just like an Italian cypress in your landscape. When you go down to Memorial Garden, and I hope you will, to, it's always, graveyards are a great place to look at woody plants. This is a nice tree. This is the one I was telling you that is native, but is of no use to uh, insects because nothing will eat the leaves, which means it always looks spectacular in your garden, right? So somebody shine the leaves. It smells like licorice, but don't remember, don't eat it. Um, but it's a great screen for sun or shade. And that's the hard thing to find. Where do you find a dense evergreen screen for shade? There's only a handful of plants and this is one. In the sun, it's gonna be a little bit more of this yellowy olive green, but in the shade, it's this rich, deep, glossy green. They never look good in a pot. I promise you, you're gonna look at that ugly little plant in a pot. It's always kind of flopping around, looking lanky. 
you don't need to prune it, plant it, give it some time. It's going to look like this, sun or shade, I promise. Avoid bamboos, remember, unless you've got a whole, I love bamboo. I've got 100 acres. I'm planting yellow grew bamboo for my projects, uh, but it won't be anywhere near anything it could invade. Plato Tuliatus, my hero, he was told if he dug a trench, he filled it with water and he used bamboo barrier that it would not escape. He ordered a bunch of different types of bamboo and here you see, indeed it has. And he's trying to figure out what the heck he's gonna do now. I went by the site of his old nursery uh, a few years ago and it's now an enormous parking lot um, full of tractor trailers. I couldn't find a single remnant of his enormous plant collection there, it was sad. Now, of course, some fence and some evergreen vines can be used for screen and Carolina jessamine just got finished blooming. And now this is our native red coral honeysuckle. When I say honeysuckle, don't go nuts because uh, there are native honeysuckles. This one is called Major Wheeler and it is just a better cultivar of our native coral honeysuckle because it keeps blooming and keeps blooming and keeps blooming and have blooms on it all the way up till late. I, my hummingbirds stay in it. I've had um, the orchard orioles in it. I, this is a fantastic plant. Get the reblooming forms. Uh, vine walk at Cheekwood. There's a lot of great vines. A great native cross vine. One of my favorites, tangerine beauty. I love our old um, trumpet creepers. This is a native wisteria I love, not just because it's, it's just because it's native, because it's a little easier to control. It's not going to run rampant and take over our woodlands like so many of them do, but it's a blooming machine. You know, so many of those old wisterias, I say, well, won't my wisteria bloom? Well, take it out and plant amethyst falls. Look at them coming in. So wish it were fragrant. It's not like the old ones, but look at that bloom. I planted four of them. The only clematis I'm going to tell you I like and use is this bulletproof one called Rogucci because Rogucci dies to the ground in the winter. I don't have to remember any pruning rules. Starts blooming mid late spring and it keeps on blooming all season. Dark little inky bells. I hang them uh, around my mailbox. It blooms all season. Weeping things can also, uh, I mean, uh, weeping plants can al also be used like blind, like vines. All right, I'm not going to have time to go through all this. I'm just going to mention winter interest. Please buy plants for winter interest. One of my handouts has plants for four seasons. I'm just going to show, show you some examples and another reason not to cut back stuff in winter. Because you want to look at stubs and cut off grasses and sheared back plants, or you want to look at this, the faded flowers from summer past and the grassy blowing in the wind. Plus, it's good for our wildlife if you leave things um, unshorn, don't cut back until the end of winter. Sculptural form of weeping plants. Took this picture the day we buried Plato. Actually, that's at Memorial Gardens. Winter blooming plants, winter jasmine, the hardy camellias and sasanquas. That's another shot of winter jasmine, my favorite plant for covering slopes, by the way. All kind of witch hazels that bloom in winter. Berries for winter interest. Conifers, my gosh, why don't we use more interesting conifers? We do have some that do very well in the south. This is at the Knoxville Gardens, but we have a huge collection right out here in our parking lot. And I love to photograph them during the winter months and show people all the color that is available. The colorful yuccas for winter, the barks, you know, we've got corkscrew twigs and colorful stems and fall color we know, you know, maples, maples, Chinese pistache. Remember I talked about that one? This one over in front of Steinmark. It likes sumac conditions, hot, dry. It's going to say, yeah, I'll do, but I don't sucker like sumac. I'll give you good fall color. Um, sumac I do love, and I have room for it. I love sassafras for the fall color, and it makes colonies, but I have room for it. You may not, so you might want to avoid those. Ginkgo noted for butterscotch fall color that drops all at once. And if you watch our Facebook page, um, we always notify everybody in November when it's time because it's brief and you need to rush over and get your kids up in those limbs and get a picture made. Black gum, one of our best for fall color. The shrubs for fall color, our native uh, Virginia sweet spire flowers and then fall color that stays on and on. One of my favorite um, 
Burnham, Bob Burnham's for the berries. And another one that I love is a uh, cluster berry catoniaster for the red berries in the winter. Cluster berry catoniaster even has purple leaves with red berries in the winter. Beauty berry for fall color. Osmanthus for fall bloom, the fragrance, they're not very showy, but is there anything that smells better? Have you sought out the orange flowered forms of osmanthus? The variegated and colored foliage forms of osmanthus? I've got a little osmanthus nuts. All right, Summer, we know, y'all come on over here. You know, we're gonna have, we're not gonna have a live in-person summer celebration this year just to get on past the COVID hump, but we are gonna have a fall uh, fest. At our same time as our plant sale, we will have speakers, tours of the grounds. Now do tune in for summer celebration. We're gonna have some live tours via Facebook and we're gonna have a lot of pre-recorded talks that you can watch. But come over here and walk around the grounds anytime, but especially the summer months when we have all our annual trials going. There's so much beauty Great place to take photographs with your family and friends and get your exercise always open any daylight hour. So come, come, come. I'm through with roses because of the rose rosette. I'm collecting the sterile butterfly bushes that are not going to be a problem as far as being invasive and they provide nectar all year long for or all season long for our pollinators and our hummingbirds. Yes, I know nothing eats the foliage. Remember, there's a lot of native plants that nothing eats the foliage too. This one also provides nectar all summer. Some of those native plants do not. So don't scold me about loving my buddleia. This is Miss Molly, which was bred and produced by my friend Denny Werner up at NC. There's a lot of great ones out there, y'all. Uh, crepe myrtles we know. I love the reds. They're true reds. I like that red, but y'all, they have not got a red now that has good looking bark or form, tree form. I'm almost tempted, even though I preach not to cut back crepe myrtles. If I cut them to the ground every year, it would be like a red fox, wouldn't it? Nobody would know it was crepe myrtle. Um, the abelias I recommended for all summer. Coosa dogwoods are summer bloomers and provide fall fruit for your birds. The bottle brush buckeye is a summer bloomer and fall color. Oh, and if you thought this was an old plant and a bad plant, again, breeders have gone to work for better cultivars of our old Rose of Sharon or Shrub Althea that are sterile and won't spread, that are better bloomers, bigger bloomers, columnar forms, more profuse bloomers. We have a big collection over here. We're wild about them. They love our heat and do so well. Don't have time to do hydrangeas, um, so you're going to have to join the Hydrangea Society. Look up some of Mike Durr. There is Mike and his wife, Bonnie Durr, who did all the drawings, by the way, in that manual. Uh, excellent plants woman, plants woman, as good as he is. And, um, and join the um, Hydrangea Society, and you'll know what to plant and where to get them. Uh, the many different species of hydrangeas, some more sun tolerant than others, and I would could do, you know, hours on them alone, but we ain't got time, y'all. That one is um, Ruby Slippers, bred right here in Tennessee, down at McNimble Research Station, and oak leaf hydrangeas with gold color here with a, a blue columbine. You can see it happening just about now. In about two weeks, you'll be able to take this very same photograph back here in the um, landscape. I think it's 10, maybe $20 a year to join the Mid-South Hydrangea Society. You get to go on to all the hydrangea tours, hear their speakers, and get first dibs at the plant sale, so do it. Lilac chase tree or vitex, we plant those a lot around the south for the summer bloom. Um, don't forget foliage for summer interest. This is our old Thunberg spirea, but it's a gold form called Ogon, which I love for this frothy gold foliage in the hot sun. It just does great. And you will get early, early spring bloom on that and then gold foliage. Um, and remember, I'm sorry, let me go back, back one. Using contrasting foliage, we've got these wonderful dark crepe myrtles now that we could put with gold foliage. So even when they're not in bloom, you've got that pop, that contrast of color. I love gold plants. This is a golden anise tree called Florida Sunshine that I adore. And so many great uh, kufi, we've got this New spirea, abelia, nine barks, you name it, all kind of variation in foliage color in our woody plants. And I'm gonna have to stop. The azaleas, 
got to have acid soil, got to have good drainage. They will grow in full sun, but if they're in full sun and they're hot, they're going to get spider mites and lace bug. Put them in partial shade for best performance and put them out away from the house where you can look at them from the windows instead of next to the house. I'm going to show you some pictures of Ogon, then I'll quit. Here is Ogon spirea in spring bloom. It's finished now. It was in bloom back in February. So frothy white spring bloom, golden fall color through the summer, peachy orange fall color, which stays on there so long. I have seen it start blooming again, even when the fall color is still there. Ogon means golden. Um, in Japanese, there's a lot of plants named Ogon for that reason. And its other name is sometimes sold under is Mellow Yellow. Uh, we usually have these in our plant sale. I'm not sure if we do this year, but they're not that hard to find locally. Some of the new quints that are thornless have great big double blooms, the storm double plays, the viburnums, the red buds. Huge red bud collection here, by the way. Just missed the peak. This one is Appalachian Red, which is more of a hot pink. Well, we got whites, pinks, purples, pale pinks. A weeping, weeping purple foliage, weeping golden foliage, you name it, we got it. Little Woody, one of my faves. Here's a plant that Plato loved because he said you can plant it most anywhere and it's going to succeed. I was there one day when a customer said, but sometimes they get frosted. He said, yeah, sometimes they get frosted, but you got a plant that's going to live and many years you get to enjoy the blooms for weeks. So I've, I've always repeated that. What is memory? One of the many deciduous magnolias. Please plant these instead of those Bradfords. Cut your Bradfords and your Clevelands down. I mean, it's like, you know, the horse is out of the barn and we're not going to get it back. But if you're still contributing to the invasion problem, um, then I would suggest you do something about it. Take them down and plant something like what is memory, which isn't going to do that at all. There are good crab apples and many are disease resistant. These are great for wildlife. There are caterpillars that feed on the foliage. There are flowers. They pollinate your apple trees. Um, and then of course the fruit itself, which is good for our birds and even for us. Dogwoods can be picky, but don't give up on them. You just got to get all the growing conditions right. Um, UT leads the nation in dogwood uh, research on disease resistant forms and how to succeed with a great publication you'll find online. Dogwoods for American Gardens, written by UT uh, personnel. I love our fringe trees. I love the native, and I also love the Chinese fringe tree, um, and I have both. I'm going to plant both. There's a great Chinese fringe tree in Memphis Botanical Garden. All right. Woo, I'm going to say this, and we'll stop. Look at those handouts and make a list and go shop that way. So that when it comes midsummer, late summer, fall and winter, you're gonna have, you could do a garden on nothing but woody plants and never be without beauty and color um, if you buy the right plants. So um, don't do this. Don't run in and just grab what looks good right now. Get those things that aren't in bloom yet or even through blooming because you know what they're gonna do for those other seasons. Um, and I'd say start with those winter interests, then back up, buy some for fall interest, buy some for those hot days in summer interest, and then you can succumb to some of those, you know, spring beauties, all right? Get stuff for your hummingbirds, get your solutions out there, and uh, if you want to look up my publication on wildlife with UT, my recommendation for sugar ratio is one part sugar to two parts water, which is richer than what most people will say because it imitates uh, the nectar in the plants that they prefer. Most of our salvias are in the 30% range and the jewelweed that we find out in our woodlands is a 43% sugar nectar. So you're not hurting them. They're only gonna eat as many calories as they need. They don't get fat, they don't get diabetes. They just have to come less frequently. It gives them more time to hunt insects, which is really what hummingbirds live off of. The sugar water we provide is simply fuel for hunting. All right, uh, I love my pollinators. Y'all love pollinators. We're all happy and we're planting for wildlife and we're creating beauty. Uh, I am your last class and I had to finish in a hurry. So let me repeat how much I am honored to be your um, teacher that I don't take that for granted and that you all will have the occasion, hopefully in the future, to teach me something because we are all channels of information. None of us are really, you know, authority figures. 
we, we share knowledge. Thank you for your time. If I have any questions, I'd be glad to address them. If you're ready to go, I get that. <laughs> we do have a couple. We definitely appreciate you being here. The, the chat function has been just blowing up. Uh, oh, good. Here's a question. What is a good ground cover for a shady north facing slope? Um, well, I am going to tell you that winter jasmine. Um, when we talk ground covers, everybody thinks about the little creepy things, right? Which means you're going to take a whole lot of them to get coverage unless they're very aggressive. And if they're very aggressive, you're going to be sorry. So I actually like to use shrub if it's a you know pretty good sized slope and that we have a publication. I, I have personally developed a handout. It's actually part of your group um, of the handouts that, you, that should have been sent to you. If not, I'm sure he can do that momentarily. But the winter jasmine makes a weeping green shrub that will anchor wherever it touches the soil. So if I plant one, I can cover easily six to eight square feet with one plant. Whereas if I were gonna plant a non-aggressive ground cover, which is what I recommend and get thorough coverage, I'm gonna to have to plant maybe, I don't know if I did it on 12 or 18 inch centers, a whole lot more plants. And so it's less expensive. Now, if it is a slope that's already eroding, then um, you're gonna to to do some anchoring and I have a whole nother talk on that. And you can certainly get in touch with me personally for um, my instructions on how to do that. Um, the winter jasmine will take sun or shade. The only thing it truly requires is good drainage. Um, there's a lot of other plants that could do it as well, but you know, it'll take a north facing slope just fine. Okay, we're gonna get you out of here on this one. Uh, please re repeat the name of the dense evergreen that smells like licorice and pest dislike. So please repeat the name of the dense Evergreen that smells like licorice. It is anise tree. Um, you may say anise, A-N-I-S-E. -I, <laughs> I think both pronunciations are correct. And it's written as one word. And even though it says tree, it's really a large shrub. But I do want you to write down, and this is in the handout, right? The screen handout that I sent you. And it's also in the one you can find at uthort.com. The correct species, the one that I'm going to tell you is preferable, is uh, the genus is Elysium, I-L-L-I-C-I-U-M, parviflorum, which means small flowered anise tree. And the reason I like that one is it's just a big, dense, happy looking plant. They sell other species of anise tree in Memphis that I don't like nearly as well. So be sure it is that one. Um, it is a fantastic plant and I adore it and I've had it planted many, many places, know of many people that have used it. Don't know nope. if it's ever died from eating a these tree, but it is the one that is toxic to wildlife. It smells good, so don't use it for cooking. It'll work in sunshade, wet or dry. All right, so let me stop the screen share here. Okay.